This week on Wardens, we head back to Region 4 where a lighthearted day celebrating a young hunter's first buck turns life threatening. Wardens Kuka and Goalie team up to rescue an injured hunter in the high country. Okay, okay. okay. So I was going to just... head first, I think. In Region 7, Wardens Hudson Byler and Marks chase down hunters who pass by their check stations. What could these runners be hiding? We got some problems. Calling me from Great Falls, that he was directly above the weather station. They don't have nothing except that he broke his leg. He called his wife apparently and said, "I'm down by the weather station," and I, I only know of two spots it can be, I guess. So we just got to go up there and find out. Control FG410. Yeah, FG410. Okay, I got a, a license plate for you. 2C Charlie 49880. Is that the truck with the injured hunter? I'm assuming so. I'm parked at um, what I think is the weather station here, just uh, below Rogers Pass on the east side, on the right side of the road. Negative, can you tell me? He walked up the hill above the weather station. He took the easterly side of the ravine. He said he walked to the top of the ridge. He thinks he walked probably 700 yards before he fell. Can I get a name and his phone number? His name is Kevin. Stand by for the phone number. Is that your is that your pack with everything? This is my skin. I don't have a splint, Bob. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna get a blue splint. One minute. Okay. Okay, you got a hat and everything? No, I don't have a hat. Do you need one? Um, no. Okay, here's the track. Let's go. While Goalie heads up the mountain, fellow Region 4 warden Quinn Kuka is out on the plains where the wind never stops, but checking hunters is a priority. I think you guys don't have a shortage of wind here. Oh man. Yeah, I see you. You're from Idaho? Yeah. That's cool. Do you have a conservation license on you or is it just uh do, do, do you have a dad? Let's see, I'll ho I'll hop up here and, or do you wanna hop up here and show me your license? I can give you a knife. You can cut it off and My daughter got her first buck on uh, thir Friday. Really? And, and it was the best day ever. How calm and no wind and 50 degrees. I'm like, this is perfect, because if it was too cold, I don't know if she'd want to come back. And my littlest one came with us. She's five. OK, you are good to go. If anybody, like if you guys stop at a check station again or anybody has any problems, you can just tell them that a warden already checked you and that I ripped that, okay? Okay. Oh, is that? It's not. Just rip it? No, it's not that big a deal. It doesn't mean nothing. We'll just roll it up like this and put it back on. This proud father informs Warden Kuka 
His two daughters have also scored on their first bucks. She follows the young hunter and his dad back to the family camp to check the sisters and to hear their stories. Coming up on Warden's Region 7, Warden Randy Hudsonbiler is following early morning hunters who caught his eye. Are they up to no good? It appears they're driving off road. They're creeping. The vast prairies of eastern Montana are primarily privately owned with limited public hunting. In the past few years, many of the landowners choose to participate in a block management program, which allows hunters access to their land, but lets the landowner set their own rules. So we're gonna drive in here and check on this vehicle. They're, uh, they're in Joe Leland's block management area. And it, uh, Here's they're driving off road that's against uh, the rules of this block management area. So we're gonna go and try to make contact with them up here. Man, that's all they're doing, isn't it? How are you guys doing? See if there's anything alive in this country oh, anymore. Yeah. You know, I kind of figured if it looks like a hunter and drives like a hunter, it must be a hunter. <laughs> Seeing you guys going in up there. Oh, I spotted you before you spotted <laughs> That's why you guys are all behaved. You guys know what the regulations are for driving through Joe's place here? No, I sure don't. Yeah. I just, I don't know, I guess I've always just drove wherever Joe said to drive. Okay. As long as you stay on established roads, yeah. you're fine. If you guys start cutting off across the path, which you guys aren't, but if, if, if you did, then we'd have a problem. That's the biggest thing out here on Joe's is to stay on established roads. And then yeah. if the road's wet or muddy, he doesn't want anybody yeah. on it then. We usually just, I don't know, we've hunted out here for the last 20 years. So. Yeah. You guys got your licenses? Yep. They want to. They want to check too. Do you guys want to check the license? God. What do you got for deer tags then? More than more than you'll probably use. I only got tomorrow and Sunday to hunt. Good Lord, I'm getting mauled by horses. All right. Got turkey tags. You guys, you guys want to eat, don't you? You want me to give you some oats or something, don't you? When Warden Hudson Byler decides all's good and it's time to wrap things up. Well, good deal, guys. Right. Good luck, be safe. Right. Yep. The horses agree. Five hundred miles to the west, Region Four Warden Quinn Kuka meets the family of successful young hunters. Yeah, she just came down to Deer what? Camp City. <laughs> One hundred and sixteen yards. <laughs> no competition. Yeah. Way to raise them, Dad. And now we're all successful. And your sister got one too, right? Yeah. Is it her first buck? Is it everybody's first buck this trip? That's awesome. Tell us how you got it. It was up like, yep, like on the ridge, like way up high, and then like half mile away, so we like took a nap, and we had to like do <laughs> this huge like mile loop and like come up and we stalked up on it. We like belly crawled, me and my uncle and me. We stood up, I shot it, I missed it. And so then it like stood and it ran and then it kind of like stopped momentarily. I shot again and I shot it in the back legs. Uh-huh. And so it had like no back legs and then I kill a shot in it. All right, good job. First buck. Yeah. And then this is little sisters? Yeah. 
mine, we were going to hike up in a coulee and we saw deer on the right side of us, so we crawled down and we were looking at them. It was 360 yards away, and so I pulled my gun and I'm just like waiting for it to turn. And I shot it, first time missed it, went right over its back, then second time I shot it, it went uh, right through, kind of like middle of its gut, kind of. And then it like flew off its foot, <laughs> and it, it couldn't even run. And then I shot it a third time, and it got right here, and it fell. And it was like getting up and stuff, so we had to kill shot it in the neck, and then it was dead. All right. That's cool. You want to tell yours, brother? We're hiking down. We look up on the hill, and there's the deer, and my dad's just like, big buck. <laughs> and then I lay down, and he's like, 416, and right at the top of your back. No, 316. 316. And he's like, and then I'm like, okay, and then I get up there, and it starts walking towards the brush, and he's like, okay, make sure you ride on a boom. <laughs> Drop him in one shot. Hey, which one of you guys is going to be a game warden when you grow up? That's a cool job. You're watching Wardens on the Outdoor Channel. Woo! In Region 4 near the Continental Divide, Warden Brian Goley is an hour into his climb up the steep, icy terrain of the mountain in search of an injured hunter. Hello? Hello? Um, I'm in all, at the Pishkin, but I can get there anytime. Do you need something? What do you need? You can come up to Rogers Pass. I'm gonna need some help hauling him. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll be there. Bye. Okay, we're gonna run with our lights on because they need help getting him hauled out with his broken leg, so obviously they need us. Of course, Brian was shouting to me the whole way up, so I knew it was he was getting closer and closer. Can you hear me? My half-brother is also in law enforcement. So it kind of reminded me of him coming up through the trees. They look a lot alike. He was like, wow, my brother's coming up through the trees. And you know, being in that much pain, it was, uh, it was a pretty happy sight. You're going to be on TV. Yeah. I don't know, it's the weirdest thing I've ever, nothing here, you know, just stepped wrong. And all of a sudden, everything went snap. If I move hey, what's at all, up? yes. It's gonna hurt when they move you a little. Yes, it will. Well, I'm up here on the Rogers Pass. Hey, you guys! Right up, straight up! When the uh, first medical help arrived, it ended up uh, being Billy. Hi. I didn't expect a female face, and it was very nice to see that it was a pretty girl, too, that was gonna help me out. And a little bit more comforting, too. Yeah? Not too bad, man. Did you in? lose consciousness? Not at all. Did you fall down? Yes, I did. Or just twist your leg? Twist my leg. What one? Left, top one here. I'm okay. supporting it with my, with my right foot. Do you know where? Oh, kid. It's broken right. Right here. Right down there? Right here. She's straight down. Hello? Hey, Brian, I'm about five miles away. Where do you want me to go? Where the cars are parked on the right side of the road, about a quarter of a mile from the top of Rogers Pass. And then just start hiking in there? Yeah, bring some fairly decent or, uh, hiking shoes, even if you got your uh, your ice things, because we're going to bring this guy off the hill in the snow, and it's going to be really bad. OK. OK, I'll be there. I think this is kind of like a backboard. OK. If we can get him straight, you know, we can slide him and splint it. OK. That goes back in the Which leg is it? Right here. Left, Left leg, top leg, right there. Both the between the ankle and the knee. OK. Went. But the amount of pain I was in when they put the brace on my leg was extreme. Kev, I'll be right here with you because this is not going to feel good. Oh, oh just, just, back in just the bag. relax. 
It's this leg. At that point, I think you heard me then, even from California or wherever you're at. It was, uh, it hurt a lot. Right okay, here. it's just gonna hurt, okay? We're gonna straighten this leg out. You ready? Mm. We gotta get you out of here. Yep. Yeah. Oh. I'm right here with you. Oh. We'll take her. Now let's get his shoulders onto the skid. <laughs> okay, Let me know when you're moving, guys. Okay, grab his jacket. Nope, you're fine. One, two, three. Come on, guys, all together. Let's do it. We gotta okay, hold on to me. I'm not gonna let you slide down the hill, okay? Okay, hold on to One me. One more scoop, guys. Support that one, three. Support, support, support. One, support, I got two, it. Three. One. There we go. go. How's that? Oh, okay. okay. He okay. set her down here. Okay. 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 Now. Okay, hold on. I got you. What we're gonna do is okay, just, 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 we're gonna I'm slide gonna talk them. To me in a this thing is just like taking an elk out. We're gonna slide them down. We're gonna lift them over everything with these handles. But the big thing is keeping this thing from running away. Okay. Okay. Just don't want that leg to hit a tree. Region 4 Warden Quinn Kuka is racing towards Rogers Pass to help Warden Goley and a team of rescuers carry an injured hunter off the mountainside. I'm on the top of this ridge to the, meet the southwest side of that open park. And as quick as I get to it, I'll give you a better direction. Oh, he's almost a Brian, I bet. Go right straight north from where you're at up through that open sapling. When you get that sapling, just turn it. Go straight west up on into that ridge. I don't know where they're at. No idea. I don't even know what to do when we get there. It must be on the very... There it is. With no radio and only spotty cell phone reception, Warden Kuka can only follow the footprints of the rescuers who followed those of Warden Goley. Hello? I don't know, Brian. All right, just yell out. Let me see if I can hear you. We're, we're to your left coming up. Okay. Hey! hey! Yeah, right here! Straight up! I hear you. Thanks for coming. Warden Goley spent an hour and a half tracking this hunter up the mountain. Here, put that back in and this back okay. in. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Oh, Here comes God. another man. Yep. You just watch yourself over the branch. Here we go. I'm going right over this bush, guys. The little, the other the little people on that side. When we first started out, it was, there was a lot. I had a lot of pain. It ended up being a, a spiral fracture. A lot of sharp edges along the bone to poke into your and the tissues. It's twisting. <laughs> big breasts, Kevin, big breasts. Sorry, buddy. I know this sucks. The slightest twist of the leg was like twisting your arm around backwards or something. I mean, it was just uh, incredible. Right. Yeah, let's Pulling do down. that. I, I Rotate. So. Yeah. Head first. And then at some point in time, they turned me around so that uh, my head was facing downwards. It kind of created a little bit of traction on my leg, and that, that alleviated a lot of pain. Come up here. Is, is this more comfortable? Okay, back. Is this not ready? Yes. Would you give it this last lift? This last lift is not the most comfortable it's been. Okay. 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 So I was going to do head first, I think. Our patient's getting shivery. Let's just see how long we can keep moving, okay? Up, 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 up. Watch it. Really slippery ice, you guys. How the tracks go around it. As long as only one of us falls at a time, we'll be out. Uh, yeah. And is search and rescue down there yet? Yeah, there's supposed to be on the left. That's fine. 
Down, down, guys, wait. Got a man down. Okay? Yeah. Good. Where the uh, heck right is our help? <laughs> watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Okay, I got it. Watch it. Right yep, I agree. <laughs> okay, guys, we need to let Kevin take a break. We need to switch places. Here. <laughs> you need anything? Yeah. Any adjustments? Yeah. Yeah. Blood alcohol or something. <laughs> Shot a Crown Royal wouldn't hurt right now, would it? 500 miles to the east in Region 7 near Sydney, Montana, things are about to take an interesting turn for Warden Randy Hudson Byler. He has set up a roadside check in which all hunters are required to stop. Hold on, Jim. Hey guys, Hi. you guys have any luck at all? No. Nope. Is that vehicle with you guys, the one back there? Okay, I'll let you guys go. Yeah, this vehicle here, uh, came to our signs and then stopped and turned around. Howdy. Howdy. How's it going? Good. Kind of curious to know why you stopped there and turned around. Well, I was trying to follow my wife. She was going up that way. Okay. Do you, uh, do you have any hunt licenses on you? Sure. You betcha. Whose gear do we have here? That's mine. Yeah. Where'd you get him at? Oh, down south here. And you killed the deer? Yep. What's your wife's name? Joanne. <clears throat> Joanne's out here hunting today? Yeah, she just went by up here just a little bit ago. What kind of vehicle is she driving? That little red Taurus. Carter, you're gonna need to come down to my check station. What? You need to come right down here to my check station. Oh, okay. We got some problems. You're watching Wardens only on Outdoor Channel. It's been a crazy day for the Wardens in Montana. Region 7 Warden Randy Hudsonbiler has had horses helping him check licenses. He just had a hunter turn their vehicle around to avoid a roadside check. And in Region 4, knees have been bruised and pants ripped as Wardens Goalie and Kuka and the crew slip and slide their way down the mountain with an injured hunter. Over an hour has passed since they started their downhill journey, and now finally the Lewis and Clark County Search and Rescue Team have arrived with proper equipment for this brutal terrain. Down the hill, oh my God, there's people. No, I'm gonna put my leg on. It was roughly halfway down. The team of search and rescue from Wolf Creek arrived. They also had a stretcher. The frame of it was more rigid. That was that was a lot easier on everybody. Everyone ready? Yep. yep. All right, on three. One, two, three. They could support it via ropes and uh, kind of uh, repel me almost down. And I, I definitely noticed a difference after they put another brace around my leg, and I think they tightened it up, if I remember correctly, so that my leg wouldn't twist back and forth. 
it kind of seemed like things kind of flowed after that. I got into a good position and could feel the sun was shining on me. Backcountry rescues are dangerous operations. They require expertise, proper equipment, and most importantly, teamwork. Right here, Kevin. Which side? Which side? Right here, Kevin, right. buddy. Five hours after the hunter sent out his distress call and three hours after Warden Goley found him, he was safely loaded into the ambulance thanks to the diligent collaboration of the responders. Wardens Goley, Kuka, and Holland, the Lincoln Ambulance Crew, and the Lewis and Clark County Search and Rescue Team. Good luck, buddy. Well, I gotta see everybody's face here. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Watch I tell you one thing, uh, Brian uh, is a tremendous guy, and all the other wardens that helped were uh, just, just like family. All those who helped, thanks for getting me out safely and making my hunting day a lot better than what it could have been. Five hundred miles to the eastern region seven, Warden Randy Hudsonbiler has had a hunter avoid his check station. He's caught up with him to find out why. On what now? You need to come right down here to my check station. Oh, okay. We got some problems. What? Okay. You got a whitetail bee license on this deer. Oh no. Yeah. Oh geez. Is your rifle loaded? No. Okay, it's unloaded right now. Yeah. Okay, why don't you stay right there? I'm gonna check, make sure your gun's unloaded. Okay. Now you had one in the chamber. Much of you, much of you had to drink tonight? Oh, just a few. Just we were coming back from hunting. Just a few? Yeah. You got an open container in there. So you're drinking one right now? No, I wasn't. Okay. That ain't, no, no. You've just had a few beers yep. today? Do you feel like you're buzzing or anything? No. Okay. Let's uh, let's go ahead and come down here okay. and see if we can get figured out. Uh, let's talk about the deer you have in the back of your truck, okay? Where did you get the deer at? I was just old south on, uh, well, my son-in-law, he knows the people. He, he's already left then, or? Yeah, he was right ahead of me. OK. There was a vehicle that was right in front of you when they stopped. Yeah, what did, yeah they and stopped here. He was in a Ford Ranger, I think. OK. Those two guys in there, I asked them if they knew who you were or knew that vehicle behind them, and they said no. Mm -hmm. so are you sure that was that was wrong? Yep. They, they would have known that was you behind them. So well, they should have. I wasn't very far back from them. Yeah, so I guess I don't understand why they would uh, say that and then yeah, and then take off. Yeah, I don't know. Unless they knew that there was some some illegal hunting activity oh, I, going on. We and they, didn't do anything illegal. No. Heck no. Well, you got a white-tail doe tag on a mule deer buck. I that's know, illegal. That's the only, yeah. Region 7 covers the entire southeast corner of Montana, with wide valleys, stunning buttes, and a long stretch of the Yellowstone River. There's an exquisite and yet subtle beauty in these high plains and some excellent hunting areas. To the south from Warden Hudson Byler's district in Region 7, Warden Steve Marks has his own hands full with hunters passing by his check station. Mm, How we doing, guys? <laughs> What's the deal today? You want to stop or what? <laughs> well, I, I seen this sign and I'm like, what? I haven't seen you guys in here for a while. Any luck at all? Uh, no, nothing, huh? Windy. Somebody must have got something sometime, huh? I got a coyote yesterday. Okay. You been drinking today? Hell no, I don't drink. Okay. Steve, you should not be better than that. No, I'm being, I'm being serious. We got an open container here. How many more are in the truck? 
We set up a check station here, and the very first pickup, and actually the only pickup that's come through so far, um, turns out they had an open beer in the vehicle, and the driver and the adult passengers have all been drinking. You sir had anything to drink today? No. No? None. Okay. Tell you what, I'm going to have you guys sit tight. I'm going to have a deputy come out and deal with the open all container right. issue. All right. Okay. Four eight five FG seven five. Four eight five. Can you look up? Run a driver's license check on him, please. I'm showing a valid status. Expires 2012. Restrictions: corrective lens. Lifetime total BAC DUI convictions three. Montana's large swaths of open spaces provided the landscape where wildlife and large game animals can thrive and where fair chase hunting is possible. To keep the chase fair, game wardens must enforce the rules, but in this big country that can be a challenge. Check stations help with enforcement in many ways. In Region 4, a pair of hunters stop and report witnessing an illegally taken deer. Hi guys. Great. I did call Caleb today. Yeah? We had a little deal this morning that you guys would be loved it. He said he thought it was a doe. So he put it in there and I told him, I said, you know, you can't shoot any deer on the deer. Warden Kuka begins the task of locating the illegal hunter while Warden Sergeant Steve Vintage works the check station. Hey, I'm looking for a Washington guy that was up in the Dana today. Okay. I need to know the guy, did you just hand it over to goalie or what was the deal? Right, that's exactly what I got from the witness. He came through my check station, so. They harvested a um, deer bigger than four inches to qualify as a doe, put their doe tag on it, and then they harvested on private property that doesn't allow any deer hunting. So um, they, we have their contact information. Are you in Great Falls currently at the time? Okay, I have a little bit of an issue I just need to come clear up and discuss with you. Can you give me an address of where I can come visit you right now? I'll just be down there in the lobby in probably 20 minutes if you just want to meet me out front to visit. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Back in Region 7 near Glendive, hunters blew past Warden Mark's check station, but immediately had second thoughts and returned. Though it is now clear why they didn't want to stop. When the deputy arrives on the scene, Warden Marks reports the situation. These guys started to go by this check station. And I seen the hunters on and they started to pull off to chase them. They locked her up. And he backed up to where he's at now. Passenger, the gal in the front, has an open beer between her legs, or at least she did. And the one that's drove driving. He's got three DUIs, and I'm sure he's definitely been drinking. Turns out the driver on a PBT actually blew, blew a point two three eight, I believe the deputy said, which is several times over the legal limit. With the driver blowing over the limit, Warden Marks and the deputy look to see if any of the other passengers are sober enough to drive. I probably have That's fine. This individual's actually had three previous DUIs, so he's going in right now to have blood drawn on a felony DUI. And we're gonna sit here and wait and until they get some sober people out here to drive this pickup back into town. You're watching Wardens only on Outdoor Channel. 
In Region 7 near Sydney, Montana, a hunter with an illegal deer has been left by his relatives to take the heat, and Warden Randy Hudsonbiler does his best to help him come clean. Here's what we got. We got a good uncle. Right. You, you love your nephew. Right. Love him to death, I bet. Like, like probably like your own son. Yeah, like anybody. He comes out here for Thanksgiving, and you guys offer to take him hunting with you today. And he has a rifle with him, a 243. Yep. And you guys come out here and you do some hunting and you, you kick up gear and you being a good uncle that loves your nephew to death gives him an, give, gave him an opportunity to shoot a deer. And now what you're doing here is you're protecting your nephew. You don't want to see your nephew get in trouble. So you're, you're protecting him and Ronnie's going to probably try to have some story like that too. When the reality is, is that Landon's the one that killed the deer. Oh no, 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 no. I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. Hello, is Ronnie there? Warden Hudson Byler calls the hunter's relatives back to the check station in an attempt to get to the bottom of this story. I visited you with that here at my check station, right? Do you want to maybe start over with the truth now? What? Who killed the deer? 500 miles to the west in Region 4, Great Falls Warden Quinn Kuka is tracking down a hunter at his hotel. Witnesses reported his deer was killed illegally. Warden Kuka needs the full story. So is it a doe or is it a buck? It, it's, well, it was supposed to be a doe. Okay. And it, I, we did, uh, yeah, I didn't know it had horns until, right. it, yeah, I walked up on it. The hunter readily admits he didn't know he was in an area that didn't allow deer hunting. But he's not as quick to admit that his son actually shot the deer as the witness reported. I have a witness that said your son shot it. Oh, no, guess what? Why they would they say your son harvested it? Was it his, uh, did he harvest that animal? Your, your son harvested the animal, didn't he? Uh, I, I, I did. Your son harvested it, and I know he did. Eventually, a couple of things come to light. One, the son shot the deer. Also, that both father and son have already harvested a buck this season, and that they harvested the deer in an area that doesn't allow deer hunting. Um, so right now you have a loan and transfer, you have an over limit, and you are in a trespass. So you realize there's three citations here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Basically, um, Right now what I'll do is I'll write you your trespass citation, we'll go check out the deer, and then I'll give you a call right back after yeah. I find out, okay? Yeah. Does that, that, sound, does that sound, sound okay? Warden Kuka makes her way to the processing plant to measure the deer's antlers and determine whether they are big enough to designate it as a buck. So, tagged it for November 12th, which was yesterday. He told me the head was up here though because I said I gotta go measure it and take a look at it and he said it's all up here. Right here I bet. Oh that's perfect. I'm gonna take that. Have at her. I'm taking this. <laughs> I don't know. It's hungry whitetail. <laughs> There's the four, the legal four, five, six, and three fourths. The antlers are big enough to qualify the deer as a buck, and it is confiscated from the hunter. This is my Sergeant Steve Vintage. He Morgan, just hi. he just came to How are you? assist me. Thank you. Yeah. So we measured it, and it's um, six and a half, six and three quarters. But okay. like, it's a small deer. We're we're not so much worried about that. We're kind of worried more of why you put the tag on it when your son shot it. I did the wrong thing, so, you know, whatever you guys feel is the right thing, I mean, that's my own thing. Warden Kuka and Sergeant Vintage cite the hunter with two violations. Trespassing for shooting a deer on a block management area that only allows elk hunting. Loan and transfer for using his tag on a deer that his son shot. We, yep. we're going to disregard the over limit, okay. so okay. we'll just, that one's a different, a little bit more of a bigger deal, and okay. we're willing to just kind of look past that based on what we saw and how you've been cooperating so okay. so I'll have to collect 235 and then we okay. won't see you again unless you need help on yeah. good terms yeah yeah good terms and then um, we're gonna keep that deer because you don't want to be in possession of an illegally
take an animal. There you are. Okay. All right. Thanks. You bet. Yeah. Take care. At Warden Hudson Byler's check station in Region 7, the party has grown. The hunter's nephew and son-in-law have returned for questioning and the deputy has arrived to assist with the open container issue. But Warden Hudson Byler is left on his own to interview each of the three hunters, the uncle, the son-in-law, and the nephew, and try to find the truth in their conflicting stories. I swear I did not shoot that deer. Are you are you sure you shot the deer? Yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Did well, did Landon yeah. and uh, what what what's the Ronnie. did Landon and Ronnie shoot at this deer too? No, no, absolutely not. And I'm 100% telling you the truth. It was Ronnie that shot the deer. Okay, I got some serious hangups on who killed this deer. I told my nephew, oh, here, here's my billfold. Get that tag cut out and put it on there. I'll finish gutting it out. I did not take it out of a wallet. Okay. I did not put it on the deer. So you gutted the deer? Yeah. Carter didn't gut the no. deer? You gutted it. Yes. Okay. Which, which tag did he put on the deer? He put a B tag on it. Why did he do that? I don't know. I even said I would put my tag on it. Who put the tag on the deer? Ronnie. Ronnie did? Now, tell me again, where was Landon at when, when the hunt was going on? He was in the pickup. Why was he in the pickup? Well, he walked with Ronnie, and uh, that deer got up, so I banged one time at it, and then Ronnie shot it, and that's it. Well, you just said he walked with Ronnie. Well, he didn't even have a gun with him. He just walked, just to walk through the bushes. Okay. Well, now, now I'm not. confused because earlier you just said he stayed in the truck. Well, and now, and now we got him out walking with Ronnie. He was walking, but he wasn't carrying a gun. We were wearing orange, and you were carrying a rifle. Were you carry, you were carrying the 243 with Ronnie when Ronnie shot and killed this deer, supposedly. Well, we were walking in the same spot, but then I met Carter at the road. I was already in the pickup with Carter, and then we heard the gunshot. I was by myself. He was in the pickup with Carter when I shot the deer. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me why he didn't just stay with you. You guys got caught on the spot. You guys lied to me right on the spot and told me you didn't know that that was your uncle behind you. So you can see. Okay. That's loan and transfer. Okay. He's taking your deer, I'm taking your beer. All right, that'll work. It'll, it'll close. I'm just gonna tell you this. You're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of hunting ahead of you. You got a lot of years to hunt, and you don't need to be starting out at the age 18 doing this. Okay? I understand. All right. Thanks, guys. In the great state of Montana, game wardens fight a daily battle. They fight to enforce state game laws and protect our natural resources. Get up, game warden. Everybody up and out of the tents. Today, a child is missing, and it's chaos for wardens. Also, state game range is open for antler hunters, but for one antler enthusiast, it'll be a day he'll never forget. After everything was all said and done, I told him I was going home to kiss my little boy. You know what you did wrong? Montana's Rattlesnake Valley. One of the state's most scenic and historic towns, but it's got another reputation. One that has state game wardens on high alert. Yeah, I 
can you tell me what happened? I'm saying, I'm saying. are unwelcome visitors in town, and wardens have a report that a wandering bear might have dragged away this woman's young daughter. Wardens gear up to find the girl and the bear. Sorry. Okay. Girl okay. named Loda was wearing a dress. Okay. She doesn't remember what color. Okay. And then it ran right into here somewhere according to what they said. Right away, officers find themselves in dangerous territory. Thick woods make spotting a potentially dangerous bear almost impossible. <laughs> And wardens have to wrestle a swollen Rattlesnake Creek in the search area. Across the Rocky Mountains, State Warden Dave Holland burns through rounds. It's mid-May, and Montana's game range is open to shed antler hunting. Shed hunting is big business in Montana, and Warden Holland hopes to move the elk herd west and away from the gathering crowd of shed hunters. Tomorrow when we open the game range, we're gonna have thousand, over a thousand people running around in here. So what we're gonna do is uh, we gotta get some of these elk moving off the game range. Majority of the time of the year, we want to uh, you know, not disturb them, but we're getting into the middle of May. We want these elk to start moving west get them back out onto their summer range, which is in the back country. Other officers gear up to drive the herd on horseback. If you guys can, we'll give you guys a little head start, like 10 minutes, right up and over this ridge, and then we're gonna come around and take the road and hopefully keep pushing them west. Slowly, the team drives the elk west. are moving right now. Those are the ones that we really need to move. Yeah, 10-4. They're just, they're just streaming out of here nice. Uh, they're, they're trailing. I can see them just trailing up the hill. Yeah, Brian, if you could just stay to the south of them and ride due west, that would be perfect. They're, uh, they know they want to go to home gulch. You guys are doing a good job. If they stay here for the summer, they'll eat off all the forage. And when they come back next winter, they're not going to have anything to eat. So we want to encourage them to leave. Um, we just shoot noisemakers out of our shotgun. We don't shoot at the elk. We just shoot the noisemakers in the air. Uh, we stay at a distance. Uh, these elk are out there probably, I don't know, half a mile. Um, it's a good way to get them moving. Where did he come from? Then, they stumble on an unusual find among the game range residents. Somehow, a giant painted turtle has found its way onto the range and away from its home territory. God, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, we got the crick over here, but. Yeah, really. That's, a, that's an unusual to see. Yeah. I didn't think of, when I saw when it. You, I thought you were giving me a hard time, a turtle. I was like, I was about to fall for it. <laughs> Yeah, I did. And it was a turtle. <laughs> Wardens help funnel the old turtle towards a nearby creek and get back to the elk. By early evening, the herd makes its way to Home Gulch, a safe area, clear of the shed antler hunting grounds. Just before dark, wardens turn their attention to the growing crowd. Although the gates don't open until noon tomorrow, hundreds of shed hunters have already lined up to camp out and get first shot at the giant sheds on the refuge. Nobody has a fire yet, and all horses are tied up, and everything looks pretty good for now. <laughs> okay, copy that. With so many people already on site, wardens could have a busy night wrestling the antsy crowd. Coming up. 
Hey, we uh, we do have a body up here, partially buried in pine duff. Way out on the far western end of Montana, state game wardens have their hands full on a search and rescue mission. A woman reported a bear attack on her six-year-old daughter. Nobody's seen the bear, nor the girl, for more than an hour. Teams searched the woods just outside the town of Missoula. Looks like something might have been drugged right up here. Just after lunchtime, wardens discover evidence of a potential victim. I'd like to see if there's any blood on it. There's possibly a drag trail up here where something might have been drugged. Got some blood on the grass. So it looks like maybe someone tried to deploy it, didn't get the safety off. There's actually, it looks like something happened up here as well. Once again, the needles are displaced. Mark comes right in here, and there's a, uh, a knife right here. There might be some blood. I don't know from the rain. I'm just trying to drag my foot right now. There. Oh, hey guys, I've got something buried behind me right here. Yeah, why don't yeah, we? I'm looking up. Yeah, we definitely got a bunch of blood in these jeans on the inside. That's the bad news. The good? This is just a training mission that includes actors and even real evidence. Today we were having a, well all week we're having a training here in Missoula, Montana. It's called WART training. It's wildlife human attack response team training for a predator attack on a human. Wardens spend time in classrooms learning how to respond and manage predator attacks on humans. On this day, their training gets a real life test. It's ironic that uh, we got pulled from the class today because we, we've got a report of a grizzly bear that has been shot um, by a citizen. It's uh, supposedly wounded and has limped off into the woods. Oh, you got a picture? Yeah, yeah come on. Sure, my understanding of it is he kind of... has all the salt blocks on Well, he still has some over here. So he, my understanding is the bear, he, he yelled, it it turned and went right to here. And from from his position on the porch is when he, boom. This is the one that did right up behind my cabin. State bear biologist Jamie Jonkel responds with a team of officers to the shooting scene. Right away, Jonkel recognizes the bear in the picture. It's a big female he collared several years back. The bear was walking this way when you shot? No, well, actually, if you down here, what, mm -hmm. what I did was I right here. Uh-huh. And where that cameraman is, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that's, that's, that's where the bear where I shot at. But the bear was right there by that tree. OK. Wardens suspect the bear might have been attracted to the property by a salt lick out behind the cabin. The shooter says he was trying to scare the bear off when he fired a warning shot. He tells wardens he might have accidentally hit the bear. Grizzlies are protected under the Endangered Species Act. It's illegal to shoot them for any reason other than self-defense. Jonko uses a radio transmitter to see if he can pick up a signal from the wounded bear. Wardens want to find this grizzly. 50 is active, that means it's alive. 30 means something Something's screwy. weird. Yeah. Oh, something, okay. Something's weird. Okay. Go ahead. I'm over here at the Whip Creek Bridge. You want me to run over to the Oasis, see what's going on? Montana's 75 field wardens are responsible for patrolling more than 145,000 square miles. Often, they're the first responders to emergencies. Warden Goley races to a call in Wolf Creek. People called after a sick man showed up in a bar. My name's Mike Davis. I'm going home finally. A week ago, my Cadillac went in the river, smashed up the whole front end. It, in the it went in the river, or were you driving it? I was driving it. Okay. The drunk driver ran me off the road. Okay. The man tells Goalie he checked out of a hospital earlier in the day. I just left the VA sir. All right, did they give you some medication? A patron in the bar says he's still sick. All right, I'm what? Uh, pleased to meet you. Are these your pants too? Yes, sir. I shit them in the bathroom. OK. 
Okay. What's your name, sir? Brian. Brian? Yeah, I just said that. Do you remember me just talking to you? No. All yeah, right. yeah, I do. Okay. After realizing the man's condition seems to be worsening, Warden Goley calls for an ambulance. Here comes the professionals, okay? I don't need them. I'm all right. Paramedics check out the elderly man. You got a spray thing? We can spray that chair off. Or... Oh, yeah, I, I can get, I can take care of that, sweetie. Okay. Which one? That one. Make the boat, yes. Or... Yes, actually. The man needs immediate medical attention, but refuses to go in the ambulance with the rescue crew. Do you think you need to go to the hospital? Oh, I know I do. Why'd you, why didn't you stay there when you were there? Because I'm going home first. I got an appointment on Wednesday. Well, what are we going to do with you right now? I mean, we I'm can't let you go truck. alone. I'm going to get my truck and drive home and go. And it's Wow. Now Warden Goley finds himself in a pickle. Coming up. The search is on as Montana's antler shed hunting season gets underway. It's the open of Montana's antler shed hunting season and crowds of hunters pack in to get first shot on the state's game ranges. Just uh, checking to make sure that everybody uh, behaves themselves before the big opener. This is gonna be a big free for all for the next few hours until the gates open. That's What's that big. for? What's that for? That's for bears and other oh. <laughs> antler hunters if it has to be. <laughs> his running clothes on. <laughs> yes, he's got shorts and putting on running shoes. <laughs> While the vast majority of hunters follow Montana's game laws, wardens do periodically run into trouble. Before the lunchtime opener, Warden Dave Holland discovers a group of hunters already across the border and in the game range. Hey, you're too far out. Come back to the road. You have to be just like these people. You're halfway up the hill. <laughs> yeah, down here at the end of the line, I uh, got a question whether or not they can ride horses up from there at noon uh, once the game range opens. Yeah, once. Uh, it hits noon, they can ride right from the road and they can head right up the hill if they'd like. Okay, hear that? Yep. Okie doke. All right, thank you. Okay, you bet. Up the road, a young hunter anxiously waits for the noon open outside the refuge. He's already spotted his prize. So here's, um, we're here at the Sun River Game Range and here's an antler right here and I can't wait. At noon, they're going to open it and I just can't wait. I'm going to really try to get this antler. Would anyone have some toilet paper for the outhouse? Some of these folks were up all night, and so they're going to be tired and grouchy and hungover and looking for a fight. <laughs> Just up the road, wardens discover a campsite that appears to have been trashed. No one's around, but the warden notices a nearby truck with the radio cranked. The man in the truck tells the warden drunk campers kept everyone up. Warden Holland has no problem spotting signs of the Party. Everybody up in the tents right now. Get up and get out of your tents. You awake? Get up, yep. game warden. Yep. Okay. Everybody up and out of the tents. Okay. Yes, sir. You guys have to get this cleaned up in 10 minutes. Do you understand? Okay. I didn't, I didn't even know. What Let's do it now. Get up and. I didn't, I, I didn't take part in that. Last okay, night. get up. I'm telling you to move okay. your tent right now. Okay. Everybody up. Start cleaning this camp up right now. Right now, there won't be any discussion. Start picking the, start picking these tents up and pick that garbage up right now. I'm staying here till you get it done. Warden Holland calls for backup after he realizes he's got his hands full. Wake up, you guys. 
You understand why I'm doing this? Looks ridiculous. There's beer cans and garbage everywhere. Yeah. This is a game range. This isn't a yep, we understand. a rock concert somewhere. Okay. So let's make it look good. Yep. Okay. Well, sheriff's gonna be here in about a half hour. I can take a statement from him. I love TV made wild. That's why Axe playing this joke. That's why they're making you guys look like a joke. This partier isn't happy with Warden Holland's wake-up oh, call. Up this year too. Here's the deal. If you keep it up, you're going to get arrested for disorderly conduct, all right? Another in the party ignores the warden's orders to get cracking on the camp. Wake up, game warden. Well, you're going you're gonna to hear in a minute. you got to get out here and clean this camp up. He's a military veteran. Aren't we all? No, no, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious, aren't we all? Okay. I am, that warden is, probably half the people going down this line are. There's no excuse, okay? I'm telling you right now to get out of the sleeping bag and get out here and clean this up. Stand by then. You got about 15 seconds to get out of that tent. Holland calls for the sheriff as the situation escalates. All right, just come up here. We gotta get this, move this guy along. Get him up. I'm telling you, he's, getting, he's this far. I'm right behind you. While Warden Holland wrestles the partiers at the Sun River game range, Warden Bill Copen gears up to go after trespassers on the Blackfoot Clearwater game range. His team runs into the refuge to look for poachers who might have snuck in early to try and grab sheds. There's nothing they can see on here, whether it's the elk or the bad guys. Later on Wardens. I remember thinking to myself, I have only three rounds. I have no margin for error. I cannot miss. In Montana, state game wardens investigate a shooting involving a grizzly bear. A landowner says he tried to scare the bear off his property with a warning shot, but thinks he might have accidentally hit the grizzly. State bear specialist Jamie Jonkel suspects he knows the bear. This is Frenchy Lake right here. So here's where she was shot at, right here. Here's where we think she is now. And then, uh, you know, she kind of denned up here in this Bull Mountain country. And so did her mother and so did her father. So no it's kind of cool, you know, it's a little uh, collective uh, lineage of, of bears that live right in this area. Mm -hmm. And I know she's pumped out two, two cubs. One uh, was killed on the highway, the other one lived. And then Molly uh, had, over the years that we monitor, at least two litters. And Smurdell is one of those. Hmm. Neat. Kind of cool. Really cool. Jonko used a radio transmitter to locate and track the collared bear. What it appears is the bear didn't move very far. Uh, uh, yesterday, less than a half a mile in, in 12 hours. So we're going back in today. Uh, we're gonna use a helicopter today to try to get a better look at the bear. And hopefully we find her alive and well. And, and uh, But anyway, we just have to try to figure out if she's dead or how badly she's wounded. Jamie and I talked this morning what we, we would like her to do if anything is moved to the north, come down. That that's huge open right there. Yeah, we'll just have kind of come post down. out around that open. If she's not hit, she'll come busting down that hill. Okay. And then once I get eyes on her, and then I can just hurt her like a cat down the hill. Okay. And and get her out in the open where somebody can look at her. Hey, there's a blood spot. I'll be able to see her. I'll be able to tell you from the radio. And I got comms with all you. Can. Wardens hope to spot the wounded bear from the air. If the bear's been shot, the clock's ticking to find it alive. Back at the Sun River game range, Warden Holland has his hands full with a group of hunters camped out on the eve of Montana's shed hunting season. 
Other campers in the area complained the men drank all night and caused quite a stir. You guys didn't break any bottles over here, did you? Do you guys have a shovel? Okay, make sure there's no broken glass yep. left on the ground. Scrape up the... Thank you for your quad. No problem. Basically, we got. I, I, I roll up here and there's beer cans and garbage and broken bottles. And I just saw it over there. Yeah. It don't look good, exactly. exactly. It's perception. Yeah, I understand. So we just need to. And nobody's trying to grab to your. No. And I understand where we can. You see a guy with a, me. <laughs> so. No, no, no. I appreciate your help, guys. I do. All right, guys, thank you for your help. I'll be back in a little bit. All right. Meanwhile, the noon opening to Montana State Game Ranges is fast approaching. Literally thousands of people lined up to be the first through the gates in search of prized elk antler sheds. Some sets can bring upwards of $1,000. My dad and I have been coming up for, we think about 13 years now. We came up after it started opening at noon on Wednesdays, or on the 15th. We started with the horses, rode horses for quite a few years, did pretty good. Came in one year just and walked, and now I got married and the husband comes with us now. <laughs> and we missed last year because I had a baby, but we brought the four-wheelers this year and try our luck again, I guess. This is number 13, lucky 13, we'll hope, we hope. <laughs> Coming up, as the shed antler season finally opens, one hunter gets more than he bargained for. You're watching Wardens only on Outdoor Channel. Today on Wardens, it's been mayhem. State game wardens are doing real life training near Missoula, dealing with conflicts between humans and animals. Ironically, while in class, a call came in of a grizzly bear being shot and wounded, and the search is on to try to find this collared bear. In Region 4, Warden Brian Goley is dealing with a gentleman under the influence of prescription meds, and Montana's shed hunting season opened at 12 o'clock. Hunters raced onto the Blackfoot Clearwater and Sun River game ranges in search of prized shed animals. Yeah, we opened the gate today at noon, and uh, so far everyone has behaved themselves. We, all the cars went through rather quickly. The horses took off like rockets, and a lot of runners took off, headed out into the field, and they're all up there now after antlers. It seems like everybody is happy and things are going smoothly, so we'll see how they do when they come back with their antlers. So we're just going to spend the rest of the day patrolling, answering questions. Just a couple of hours into the hunt, hunters start appearing with sheds. Everybody walking by me has got horns but me. Because you're out here on the paint on the gravel. I just get <laughs> Six by six, match set. Brother-in-law found them, but I'll take claim for them. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty heavy one. Oh, no, I'm going to say 13. <laughs> Yeah, I can go about 14 and quarter. 14 and quarter. 14 and quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta find the other side to it though. Good luck. <laughs> Over on the Blackfoot Clearwater Game Refuge, Warden Aaron Berg races to a 911 call. We were out patrolling earlier today. We opened up the gates so the people could come in. And uh, at about 12.45 p.m., we got a call over the radio. An individual had called 911 stating he had uh, had to shoot a grizzly bear in self-defense that was charging him. There was some witnesses that actually seen. Did you hear two shots? Two shots. That's all shot. 
realized the cubs were between him and the sow. The sow didn't like that, so she took Chase to him. He was running for the truck, you know, I mean, he, he literally... The bear was definitely chasing this guy. I ran. <laughs> Fight or flight, my choice at that time was flight. And I guess the story is uh, this individual was walking this ridge, head down, looking for antlers like everybody else is. It was about five minutes to noon when I got to Clearwater Junction. I was going to go into the, the first gate, and there was people lined up all along the highway. Well, I decided I wasn't going to go in the first gate. I would, access another way so I kept driving up the road and by the time I went up about four switchbacks I had already caught the end of the line everybody was still driving so I figured I'd get out and do a short hike and see if I could find some antlers while they were all still in their vehicles driving I left my GPS my backpack my water everything in the truck so I was just gonna do a hour-long hike back to my truck and then go to the original spot that I wanted to antler hunt. That day, there was 35 to 40 mile an hour winds. I did not pack pepper spray with me. I had pepper spray, but I did not bring it with me that day. That day, I chose to pack my 44 mag pistol. I hiked approximately 25 minutes I was looking on the ground for an antler, and I looked up, and she was already at a lope coming at me. I wasn't sure at that point if it was a grizzly bear or a black bear. At that point, I got as big as I, as big as I could, started waving my arms and hollering as loud as I could. Hey, bear, hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. Well, when I hollered at her, she went from her, from her nice little lope to the full out charge. Hey, hey, no. I still hollered at her, hollered at her. I pulled out my, pulled out my pistol and I was still waving my arms and hollering at her. She closed the distance to less than 10 yards. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, no, hey, hey! She kind of bit at the place that I shot and she ran past me. The first thing that came to my mind was, wow, she didn't even, she didn't even drop a step when I just shot her with a 44 mag. In Montana, the number of bear attacks and other predator encounters are on the rise. Game wardens are often the first responders on scene, exactly while the Montana game wardens are getting a little extra training. It, it, getting us more prepared for when those attacks do occur and you can respond to them and help everyone that's there, help the family members and the victim, and plus help the defending animal. Today, wardens take part in a scenario gathering evidence after an apparent attack. The primary purpose of the scenarios is to give the students training, the officers training in how to respond, how to investigate them, and also it helps them deal with the stress that they're going to encounter when they get on the ground in an actual real life attack. Or Near Lincoln, Montana, wardens search for a wounded grizzly bear. A landowner tells wardens he's fired a warning shot to scare the bear off his property. Turns out the landowner admits he might have accidentally hit the grizzly. Wardens have been tracking the radio collared bear for two days, unsure how seriously the sow might be injured. Now, they hope a helicopter will help track her down. Oh, there she is. Wardens finally catch a glimpse of the big grizzly crossing an old logging trail. She looks healthy enough that wardens won't intervene. Well, I thought you were blowing a little smoke back there when you said you could herd bears, but you can herd bears. 
And when I first got up there, I said, well, she's, I could tell right away because the beeps were moving and I could see she was doing uh -huh. pretty good clips. I think she was a little up on the top in a nest. Yeah. She didn't, move, she didn't move much from yesterday at all, really. She yeah. stayed in there the whole time. So. Probably so. Yeah. And this is this type of scenario, you know, where this is an educational deal and he needs to realize that he could have taken a, uh, a valuable bear out of the population. Look at all the cost that it took for us to come up here to follow up on this. You know, we probably have with helicopter time and everything else, three to four thousand dollars in this whole two-day deal. Well, we're not done either. Yeah, yeah, yeah and monitor, you guys will have to keep monitoring it. Wardens determined the bear was, in fact, shot, but not seriously wounded. You know, and if he doesn't end up getting charged, and he gets a good freaking, you know, slap that, you know, geez, you screwed up, you're getting lucky. Warden's ticket the landowner. He faces a $1,000 fine. The shooting proves people need more education. Exactly why Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks run spring clinics to teach people how to protect themselves in bear country the right way. You do not want to put this on your tent or on your clothes. Okay, this is made with capsaicin, which is a very, very potent pepper. If you encounter a bear, if the bear is not aware you're there, you don't need to say anything. Just keep backing up. Just don't take your eyes off of the bear, but just back up, back out of the area and leave the area. But if the bear is aware you're there, start talking to it. Let it know that you're a human, okay? Let it know that you're not prey. Start leaving the area. Go ahead and get your bear spray out and have it ready. But most of the time, they're not gonna bother you. But if the bear does happen to come into you, you have seven to nine seconds in this camp, and that's it. So you don't wanna start spraying, okay? You wanna be backing out, talking to the bear. Whoa, bear, whoa, bear. This is also under pressure. So if you can, you wanna use two hands. But if the bear comes into you, you wanna do two sweeps. And what you're doing is you're building a wall in front of you. Just like that. And see what I've done? I've built a wall. The bear's coming in. You're backing out, you're backing out, you're backing out. You're talking to me. You're talking to me. Okay, here I come. Once the bear has hit the spray, he will cough. And a lot of times his eyes will, he'll, he'll water and he'll turn. But you want to be leaving. You want to be backing out the entire time. Okay, I'm coming into you. What do you want to do? You bet. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and get rid of that. It's tough, isn't it? It's a lot harder than it looks. That fast, that fast. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> they make, like I said, they make these wonderful uh, inert training cans and they do sell these and these are really nice to just become familiar. If I stomp my foot and I put my foot down, it's a bluff charge. It's not real. Maybe it's a bluff charge. That fast, I'm here. Nice stuff, but do the sweeping motions, you bet, but good job, come on in. You wouldn't hand somebody a 44 and say, oh here, go protect yourself without teaching him how to use it, right? Well, you don't want to do the same thing with the bear pepper spray. You want to learn how to use it. Coming up, wardens have their hands full once again. An elderly man refuses medical attention. You have my full permission to search that vehicle for contraband or anything else. Wolf Creek, Montana. In Region 4, Warden Brian Goley assists paramedics with an elderly man who refuses medical attention. Excuse me, is that a news camera? No. Yeah. We can look. Okay, now you're fine. Okay. We're going to have to have these guys tell us it's okay to, or you if you're my, telling us. You have my full permission to search that vehicle for a contraband or anything else. Okay. We're oh, not worried about that. I'm there. not a drug runner, you know, I could be. <laughs> I guess I we... could be carrying all kinds of marijuana. Let's go find out what <laughs> Warden Quinn Kuka arrives on scene. They get permission to search the man's truck to try and find his medicines and hopefully an ID. I ain't seeing his medication, are you? Unless this is what his medication is. It's even taped shut. Probably is. Oh, I don't want to open that. Oh, well, yeah, it might be his wife, yeah. 
Tucker Davis. Oh. <laughs> we just found Tucker Davis. Oops. Tucker, you go back there and you'd be good. I'm not, I'm not being funny, but I'm just like, what do you do? I'm so worried about this guy. How he even got here? Almost opened up. Oh, wait a minute. I don't know what that was. Oh, there we go. Okay. Is Sunday's gone? No, there's there one in there. there. I don't know what it is, I won't take it. Yeah. Those are, they are cancer mad. He's had morphine today and he's had admittedly um, beer or alcohol today in combination. He is not oriented to time right now. You can't let him drive away, he's been drinking beers. Cool is full of beer. I'm not gonna let him drive anywhere. <laughs> oh, he did you call her? Cool. They're trying to find With the ambulance crew and deputies on scene, the wardens get back to patrol. We get a lot of calls like that that we help on sometimes when you're out here in this big country and it's a long ways to find help and so we're trained in first aid, first responders, stuff like that. So we go to a lot of those calls just to help the county out, help people out. Um, sometimes, you know, we're the only law enforcement around and so we all work together, help each other out and that was just a case of that. In Region 2 at the Blackfoot Clearwater Game Range, Warden Aaron Berg interviews a hunter who says a grizzly bear tried to maul him. When she was charging me, I remember thinking to myself, I have only three rounds. I need to wait till the last possible moment to shoot because I have no margin for error. I cannot miss. Well, the first shot didn't even slow her down, so I thought wounded bear going that direction. I'm going to go that direction. <laughs> I made it approximately 20 yards, and I was running by some shrubs that were not very tall. And out of the shrubs ran two little cubs. At that point, I thought that was a sow. I turned around to look, and my worst fears were true that she was chasing me, charging me again. The witness from up on the hill actually saw that happen. He saw the bear chasing this guy through the woods. He was running for the truck, you know, I mean, he, he literally... I was running as fast as I could to, to make it to the two trucks, you know. In my mind, the two trucks at the main road were was the light at the end of my tunnel. The only way that I can describe the feeling, you're in a train tunnel and you're walking right down the middle of it. Here comes a train in one end and your only chance of survival is hitting the end of the tunnel. The game range was crowded that day. What Roy didn't know, this was the third human encounter this sow had had that day and he was directly in her escape route. And I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I kept turning to see the gap between me and her. The gap just kept closing. I could feel my lungs burning. She just kept gaining on me. I was not gonna make it to the trucks. Your mind's just going a million miles an hour. I also thought about my little boy. I didn't know if I was gonna get to see him again. I turned around to see how close she was gaining on me. As he ran, he tripped and fell. And I had tripped over a log and twisted my ankle. At that point, I thought I was getting mauled. In Region 2, shed hunter Roy Johnson stumbles upon a grizzly bear with cubs. He finds himself literally running for his life. I had never ran so fast in my life. Bet you I ran a 4240. I turned around to see how close she was gaining on me, and I had tripped over a log and twisted my ankle. At that point, I thought I was getting mauled. I turned around and I pulled out my gun just in time to shoot her 
right in front of me. And she skidded on her face right a couple feet away from me. Somehow it incapacitated her spine and or uh, mobility in her rear end. The warden's investigation determines Roy's encounter was the grizzly's third with a human that day. After that, the bear retreated, dragging its tail end um, with its front legs. At that point, I, I tried to call 1-800-TIP-MONT, but it asked me if I would like to do this, press number one. If I would like to do this, press number two. And I didn't want to do any of that. I just wanted some help. So I hung up and I dialed 911. A, a game warden was the first one to show up. Warden Aaron Berg showed up, you know, made sure that I was okay because I was, I was limping. We assessed the scene, the Cubs were there. She was definitely not gonna be rehabilitatable, so we had to dispatch the bear. Yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's too bad. Uh, I mean, it does happen, it does. We hate to see it happen. Uh, however, uh, you know, when you do these kinds of investigations, uh, yeah, we care about the wildlife. That's why we put our lives on the line every day to, to take care of the wildlife and protect it. But, you know, um, uh, there is a place for people too. And uh, that kid, he made a choice to do what he had to do to go home safe to his wife and kid is the bottom line. And, um, and that's okay. With the female grizzly dead, wardens now need to figure out what to do about the two orphaned cubs. The state calls in a trapping truck to try and lure in the cubs. Warden Berg keeps the area blocked while the state sets the trap. Within the hour, the trap catches both cubs. Uh, unfortunately, um In the great state of Montana, game wardens fight a daily battle. They fight to enforce state game laws and protect our natural resources. Today, Region 4 Warden Brian Goley gets the runaround from anglers. You should know where you are. Where were you? In Region 2, the fish are spawning and the temptation is just too great for some. While Region 1 Wardens dive in the Kootenai River on a life-saving mission. And it all happens right now.
Dangerous water rescues are just another emergency a game warden must be prepared to face. Today, they train for worst case scenarios. Sometimes you run across situations where a victim's in the water, and obviously it's fear and panic. Warden Sergeant John Obst trains Montana's water rescue teams. Today we're working with David Thompson Search and Rescue over here in Libby, Montana. And we've been developing with them a swift water rescue class. The whole purpose is to get them real familiar with moving water such as the Kootenai River here, or even small lakes and streams that sometimes can develop into high risk, um, high potential for getting entrapped or swimming in the fast water. Um, go ahead and pair up. Try and see if you can max out the rope bag so you know your distance. Today we're gonna simply start out with throw bags. And rope throw bags are probably the most useful tool that people can have on the boat or wardens in their vehicles. It's a way to reach out into the water instead of actually getting wet. Throw the person a rope and bring them into shore. Victims struggling in cold water can put up a dangerous fight. Wardens must learn to react and get swimmers back to the shore safely. But anticipate the moment he gets tight on that rope, you're gonna feel his body weight and current pulling on you. Your objective is to pendulum him in. And let the current do the work and bring him in. If you look here, here's a big eddy right here. See that turbulent water, that's the eddy pinch. And it's got a big eddy. If you know the river, and know how to read it a little bit. From the rope though, we kind of progress into, say, victims in the water who can't help themselves, who wouldn't be able to grab the rope. He's either cold, hypothermic, or he's unconscious. So you're gonna have to go get him. And that's what we call live bait. It's gonna be you going out and getting that swimmer. out there patrolling. Um, a lot of times we're the only person um, out there. We're the first responders. We're, we're usually out there in the field checking fishermen, checking anglers in these uh, water conditions. And, and uh, a lot of times we're the only people on the site or unseen what, that have any experience. Don't be so committed to the land. You could walk out here and extend your reach, you know, another 40 feet before you even worried about it. You got great footing. Anybody could have come out to here where you got good footing, throw them, and then you don't have to throw this distance. You're already in the water. Remember your teamwork, pair up. John goes out here, I'm going out here with him. John, John's ready to throw. Okay, John, I got you. That way we, we hook up, then we've got two guys in the water because we're a little buoyant at this point, like John said. So it's gonna take a little bit more weight, a little bit more of a fat ass hanging out there to, to give you some balance and pull somebody in. They've been in the water long enough, their brain's not functioning. So simple command, hey, I'm gonna throw you a rope, grab it when it comes to you. Nothing else, you get their adrenaline back up and they get a little more energy in them. While Region 1 Wardens train, Region 4 Warden Brian Goley gets a report of a young boy struggling in the Missouri River. It's spring in Montana, and cold snow runoff from the high country drops temps in the rivers to dangerously low levels. All right, well, I'll be coming as fast as I can. I might see you there. Wolf Creek, Montana. In Montana's Region 4, State Game Warden Brian Goley races to the scene of a reported water rescue. Dispatchers say a small boy is adrift in the cold Missouri River. He's conscious and alert, no injuries, here with Grandpa, he's doing fine. So the little kid is safe. Warden Goley drives to the scene to try and figure out exactly what happened. How are you doing? Did you do that all by yourself? You not know how to drive it or what? I know how it's just, it quit on me when I tried to get pulled up to shore. Huh? And then it wouldn't start. Did he just take off by himself or what? Well, he, we drifted off right here. I got in, started the boat, and everything was running. Uh huh. And then we unhooked it. And I tried and to pull it up to shore. And he, and he, and he was cool. just going to pull it in. Uh huh. So pulled, when he went to go forward, it killed on him. And I was, when I got back, he was out there, old baby, 30. Okay. And I'm explaining to him what to do. 
Well, as he was turning, it was to choke it. You got to push the key in, and we're right. turning it, and he was pushing it in. He probably. This young boy was helping his grandfather launch their fishing boat. That's when the boat motor died and drifted away. I don't know how to start the boat. It's just it it quit on me and it flooded. You know, yeah. He, he, you know, yeah. when you first started up, you got to choke it, and that's when he was probably pushing in, but it had already been running. Yeah, well, that happens. I kept talking to him on the phone, and he would, he'd get panicky. You know, I said, "You're okay as long as you're staying in the boat. Eventually, you'll come to shore." You know. Right. And and then and then his phone went dead. So I had walked all the way down the shore, and then where they got the big island right. down there, I couldn't really cross, and he was drifting across. So then he was just oh. From that big electric pump, he was probably a quarter mile downstream. So then that's when I walked across that field. And he was already standing on shore with the rope with the boat. Bounced right in there then. Lucky, I guess. I thought it was a little raft, though. It's a big boat. Yeah, yeah it's a little jet. Bigger boat. I thought it was just a little raft with yeah. no motor on is what they said, but that's oh, not yeah. what it is. Yeah. Well, a couple of things that I just wanted to educate you on is, of course, he cannot be in a boat when it's by itself because okay. he's not old enough. Mm -hmm. And number two, you gotta have kid life jackets and do you have those on there? Yeah, yes, we just took them off. Okay, got all right. So that's one of the reasons why you can't, under the age of, you know, they can't be in there. Okay. Although the boy is too young to legally drive a boat alone, Warden Goley decides a verbal warning is enough. Uh, because he's just too young and he didn't know how to do it. But you're just unloading your boat. I understand mm -hmm. that, it's just an accident. So, not the end of the world. We just want to make sure he was okay. Okay. All right? Almost the end of me, though. No, you you did really good. You didn't panic. You and did. now you know what to do next time, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're okay, then. We're out of here. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay? Yeah, tell you about Tell good them luck. thank you. Thank you. See you later. I'm glad you're okay. okay. How are you doing? Good. All right. Back in Region 1, Warden's trained for worst-case water rescues. Sergeant John Oakes trains Montana rescue teams. Along with rope and swim rescues, teams train to navigate what rescuers call strainers. This is, uh, simulates a, a strainer. We're gonna have to, we're gonna hang that in the water, just so the water's just barely breaking over it, and you gotta swim and swim up over it. And a strainer is just any object that's in the water that you can get entrapped on that will pin you against it, such as bridge abutments. Most common around here are trees that have fallen in the water. But what we want to do is teach people not to get pinned up against it, but to come up to it as quick as they can and leap over it, basically swim over the top of it. It's a really tough drill. It's one that is hard to actually manipulate and do. But we need people to be so conscious of that that they avoid them at every chance possible. You're not gonna you're not gonna beat it by jumping over all the time. The best way is just to completely avoid it. This is tough training that takes a toll on rescuers. We had some really big guys here who think he can muscle over it, but you're never gonna muscle over and beat the hydraulics, the effect of the water on it. This woman takes a knock and loses her helmet. Obviously, are worn through a lot of work out there on the rivers and on the lakes, and a lot of times they do work by themselves. Occasionally, they get to work with pairs. So, we want to make sure that all the wardens that we have out there come back safe. And then, if they run across the situation, they know what to do and they have the right tools and equipment and training to make sure that they can do a rescue without hurting themselves or the, the people that need the help. After the long Montana winter, anglers are itching to get outside. But it's still early spring in Montana, and only certain areas are open to legal fishing. Georgetown Lake remains closed due to the area's critical spring spawning habitat. Warden Terry Althouse is on patrol protecting the resource. I think there's a fishing pole by the guy on the right. Yeah, they're fishing below the white van. Coming up, 
wardens confront anglers. Um, there is an issue here, Cody, with the fact that the lake is closed this time of year to fishing for spawning. Anaconda, Montana. Spring fishing is closed on Georgetown Lake. It's home to key spawning habitat, and just downstream sits the state's Washoe Trout Hatchery. The hatcheries really were our first, you know, basically the first fishing game. That was the, the Department of Fishing game, so there's a lot of history here. The Washoe Park Hatchery was built in 1907, so we've been open for more than 100 years now. The property was donated by the Anaconda Company and, and the water rights also. At the beginning, uh, the state was just an egg eyeing station, basically. They used uh, Georgetown Lake. They had an egg taking station at Georgetown Lake where they took eggs from grayling, cutthroat, rainbows, and brook trout. Um, they would keep the eyes, the eggs up at Georgetown Lake um, until they were eyed and then they would actually bring them back to the hatchery to rear. Um, in the early days, um, the state actually had its own railroad car called the Thymalis, which um, they would load the fish into milk, uh, milk cans and at every river crossing, they would dump fish into the rivers. Now, state hatcheries are key to providing fishing opportunities in many of the state's most popular rivers and lakes. The Washoe Park Trout Hatchery holds the state's West Slope Cutthroat brood stock. Our job is uh, supplying eggs to other state hatcheries and federal hatcheries in Montana. We keep 100% pure cutthroat brood and they're tested genetically every year. Um, and so our job is just to maintain that genetic diversity and supply eggs and fish around the state. We spawn over about a six week period. Uh, every week we sort the fish to see which ones are ripe. They'll all ripen up at different uh, stages throughout our spawning period. So what we do in the morning is we just go ahead and go through them, find all the ones that are ripe, which means they're ready to release their eggs. And then we'll go ahead and spawn those later on the same day, taking eggs from our females, Um, and then also uh, milt from the males, making production eggs. So um, those are a cross of three-year-old females and three-year-old males. Those fish will just be used for um, sporting purposes. We want his genes, guys. <laughs> Size matters. <laughs> Carrie's adding the sperm, pooled sperm from 10 males, and then she'll add water. The whole fertilization process takes about 15 seconds. You don't see that on Martha Stewart. So what we do after fertilization is we, we rinse the milt the, off the eggs and then we place the eggs in, a, in an iodine bath for about 30 minutes. Um, we call it water hardening. Um, when the eggs are in the water hardening process, um, they want to soak up as much water as they possibly can. So what we do is we put them in the iodine hoping that they'll, that they'll soak up some iodine into the egg and then that that will um, help them kill any bacterial diseases that could possibly be in the egg and also on the outside of the egg. After fertilization, water hardening, um, the eggs are transferred into the incubation room. The eggs will uh, be eyed up, which means you'll actually be able to see the eyes inside the egg after about 12 days. From eye up to hatch is about nine days. Um, from hatch until they actually swim up and are ready to eat food, it's another 14 days on top of that. Coming up. Let me have that one. Oh, that ain't one. That's from Idaho. Okay. Warden Goley has his hands full as he questions a group of suspicious anglers. Here's the deal. I asked you if you had fish down there and you said no. Okay, you said you just got here and you didn't have any fish. What's the deal? Georgetown Lake, Montana. In Montana's Region 2, State Game Warden Terry Aldhouse keeps an eye on anglers. 
Georgetown Lake remains closed to spring fishing. Even so, Ald House spots several fishermen. I'll turn a little better in clear. They're all down on the shoreline. Wardens often use high-powered optics to keep an eye on people from a distance, and it prevents the wardens from being discovered. Green shirt just handed the pole to the middle woman who just now cast. And now all three of them are fishing. In Montana, fishing in closed waters can result in a fine of $135. He's working, setting up a third rod for himself. Came his to her. After the warden confirms these people are in fact fishing in a closed area, he drives down to confront them. Hello, it's going all right yourself. You guys been here long? Maybe. Pretty day to be out and about in anyway. Yeah. Need to uh, trouble you for a fishing license if I could. Yeah. All right, and they have their licenses down there, you think? With them? I'm not too sure. I can bring them up here for you. Well, I can go down there and ask her too, no problem. I'll come right back up here. We'll get a look at theirs and I'll get you this license back. Yeah. Okay. Um, guys, one of the reasons I needed to talk to you today other than checking the licenses is I'm wondering if you had had a chance to look at any fishing regulations or if you had any with you. Do you have some with you? Um, there is an issue here, Cody, with the fact that the lake is closed this time of year to fishing for spawning. Growing up in Butte, you probably looked at regulations here, but just not recently. Okay, you weren't aware that there was a closure in the springtime at all. The state closes down some of the shoreline along Georgetown Lake to July 1st to protect spawning fish. The rest of the lake opens the third Saturday in May. It appears these anglers missed the clearly marked signs in the fishing regulations. Here we go. You look on Georgetown Lake here. Mm -hmm. First sentence is open third Saturday in May through March 31. So that's a week out. You just haven't been up here much recently, it sounds like. Yeah, I haven't really been back this way for a while. You're gonna probably want to double check these. Okay. Some of the more popular fishing areas, of course, have stricter regulations just because so many people fish and it's the only way to keep it going. And, and this is because of the spawning. We're trying to keep people out of the spawning till that's over with so that it you know, kind of helps augment the population. Basically in the wild what happens is um, there's cutthroat trout have different life stages. Um, you have resident fish and non-resident fish. There's fish that live in the stream their entire life. Um, and then there's fish that are spawned in a, that are born in a stream and then go into a, a bigger body of water, like a big river or a lake, and then they'll actually return to the, their natal stream possibly to spawn. And what they do is they'll run up the stream into the coldest, cleanest water that they can find, and they're looking for um, a very certain substrate to dig, or, to dig their red or their nest. Um, and the female will dig the red, um, and she'll kind of guard it. Uh, until she's ready to spawn, and then she'll release her eggs into the nest, um, and the male will come up and, and right up next to her and, and fertilize those eggs. And that's, that's why that fertilization process is so fast, because generally it's happening in moving water. So the male will come up and he'll fertilize those eggs, um, and then she'll kind of cover them back up with her tail, and that's it, they don't, uh, cutthroat don't guard their eggs or anything there. From there on, the, the eggs are on their own. On Georgetown Lake, Warden Aldhouse deals with anglers called fishing in a closed spawning area. What I'm going to do here, guys, is there is, you know, of course, a problem with fishing in closed waters, but sometimes we have to look at this and how we're going to deal with it. Um, typically, people can be fit, fined for fishing in closed waters, but I'm thinking that you probably didn't set out here today to do that. So basically, what I'm going to do is issue a more minor violation here than the closed waters, and that would be just a rule and regulation violation. And uh, I'll explain to you how you go about taking care of that. As long as you promise me that you'll put a little more effort into learning your regs, we'll go that, that way, okay? Warden Aldhouse issues a commission rule and regulation violation for $135 and allows the anglers to go find legal water to fish. Are you guys looking for a place to go today yet to to fish because I can point you to some open waters. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, you know where East Fork Reservoir is? Yes. 
Okay, yeah. you can go over there. Okay. Any questions, you guys? No. Okay, well, I hope the rest of the day goes safe. Already. All right? Yep. See you later. Up next, Wardens Patrol, one of Montana's biggest wild resources. There are a pile of fish in there. You're watching Wardens only on Outdoor Channel. Today on Wardens, State Game Warden Brian Goley received a call of a young boy adrift on the Missouri River while Region 1 Wardens were training for just that type of rescue. In Region 2, Warden Terry Althouse protects the delicate spawning areas of Georgetown Lake. And now, back in Region 4, near Craig, Montana, Warden Goley patrols the Missouri River. I had been here before with the same guy and I just cannot remember what it was about. Hello. How's it going today? How's fishing? Pretty slow, huh? Not so good out here today. Looks like you're already cooking. After lunch, he stops two anglers to check licenses. No big fish to show me today? No, there's, well, we found a dead one in the water when we got here. Well, we that, there for the birds to eat. that <laughs> happens, doesn't big it? Rainbow, actually. Really? Was it yeah. a fresh kill? Or? I, no, it no, was in a bed too old. Yeah, it, it's laying right up there. Look at that, steak's cooking. We yeah. hit this just right. Yes, sir. They both have valid Montana fishing license, but both men are fishing using two poles apiece. You guys, uh, you know the, how many fishing poles you can have here? Two? Yeah, it's two one. between one. One. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I've met you here before, haven't I? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, we fish here a lot. Out. Yeah, I'm trying to remember yeah, that. Yeah, last year we had that, um, the one tied there that was like, it was like 22 and a quarter inches or whatever. Remember, okay. you didn't have yeah. your, your mm -hmm. rules, so right. we weren't, weren't dead on the... I thought it was two poles between uh, Cascade and... One pole in the, the river, period. Oh, really? Yeah, one pole up to two hooks per line. Oh. Mm -hmm. the bear tag. That's the one right there. It's got your name on it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. This is the right one here in my nose. Rodney King. <laughs> <laughs> you get harassed about that on occasion? Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's about, what, 12 years now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I guess it's more cool. What are you guys using for bait? Night crawlers. Okay. Well, okay, here's the, here's the deal. You got a real real one pole in a piece. Okay. Okay, you can be charged a $135 fine for each pole. Oh, really? Yeah, so that's so, mm -hmm. you know, you add that up and that's between two guys, that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but since you just got here, do you have a copy of the regulations or no? Yes, yeah, sir. yeah. Are they the brand new ones? Yeah. 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 Occupation we were, we were is. We talking about that it had changed to, to, uh, to only three fish allowed. Right. Is that, that's correct, right? Yes, that is correct. And only one over 22 inches, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so if you look under hook and line limit, okay. under the Central Fishing District, which is where we're at, if you look at the boundary. Okay. There is isn't range, one line with two hooks per line. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, now. Lakes, okay. two lines with two hooks. Okay, that's, right. that my, that's my confusion then. All okay. right. Warden Goley gives both of the men a verbal warning and moves downstream to check other anglers. You know. Okay. See you guys later. Hey, thank you very Take much. Take it easy. In Montana's Region 1, Captain Lee Anderson patrols another sensitive spawning stream close to spring fishing, although the lake remains open. Today we're out at Rogers Lake, which is just uh, about 15, 20 minutes west of Kalispell, and we're going to go out and try to check on one of the main uh, grayling spawning streams. Uh, it's uh, closed right now. It's closed till the third Saturday in May. And uh, it's kind of a real important biological thing because uh, this is where we get a lot of the, uh, the eggs for uh, the fish hatcheries to uh, supply grayling with uh, pretty much the rest of the state of Montana. There are a pile of fish in there. And uh, 
You can slip down here, check it out. I think what we'll do is, I think if anybody was gonna be here, this is where they'd be at. No need for them to go upstream much, but we can check this out and then uh, we'll slip around and go try and get a couple uh, angler checks on the other side and see what's happening. So you can see that they're obviously susceptible to uh, pretty easy harvest if somebody really wanted to come in here. But fortunately, most people aren't into that. Warden Anderson uses optics to spot nearby anglers. How's it going? Oh, I can't complain. What could I get you to maybe paddle over here? I'll check your fishing license real quick. Well, I suppose I can do that. All right. I do have a question for you. Yeah, you bet. Why did they change the limits on the grayling in this lake? Is it, are they that? Well, I, I was um, actually just yesterday, I was talking to uh, Jim Vasher, the fish manager. Yeah, I know Jim. And I asked him about that and uh -huh. uh, at one point, this was like a spawning. Well, it's still where we get all our eggs statewide, you know, oh, really? for the for the grayling. But mm. uh, it was uh, at one point the only place, and they were that they were getting uh, a genetic strain of these grayling. I think they were using them down in Red Rock, and then they found there it wasn't quite actually what they had hoped for. And then now, I mean, they're spawning like thousands and thousands of them and it can handle it 99 percent of your fishermen out here aren't or keep the fish aren't any. keeping them anyway so uh yeah. it, it it can handle it and it just went to a standard limit keeps it more simple you know across the board and uh, the cool. resource can take it so i mean i like it that's i think neat. that's in a uh, that's it in a nutshell it was surprising James, there we go. That would be me. 2012. Looks like you're good to go, my friend. All right. And yeah, that, you got your life jacket on. Sweet. Good talking to you. Can I have a beer anyway? You can have a beer. I wish uh, <laughs> no, I could no, do no. the same. Don't say it. You're on camera. <laughs> <laughs> this angler checks right. out, so Anderson moves on. Cool. Coming up. Warden Goley confronts a suspicious angler along the Missouri. Or with that, what are you walking around with that backpack for? For the weight, for training. Okay, what do you have in there? Uh, fishing stuff? It's just all fishing stuff in the mountain, dude. Uh-huh. Okay, so, hmm. Wolf Creek, Montana. Near Holter Lake Reservoir in Region 4, Warden Brian Goley stomps a suspicious car. Good day or good evening, huh? Here, I'll help you out there without trying to blind you. Let me just have that one. Oh, that, that ain't one. That's from Idaho. Okay. He wants to know if these anglers have a valid fishing license. Immediately, the warden realizes the story isn't quite adding up. That's your deer license. I know you got it. Okay, Daniel, Ooh, there it is, Daniel. Sportsman, there you go, sir. I just need to check your fish. Are we missing one person? Are we missing a person? Yeah. Oh. I thought there was three of you. Oh, well, he's a friend of ours running around up and down the bank. Oh, he's just trying to catch his limit? Well, no. Well, you can. Hey, we got another one here. Nope, okay. So no, that's your guys' limit? The boat. Yeah, I got okay. three, he got two. Okay. And the other guy is where now, you said? There's another guy fishing, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't think he's fishing today, it's true. So when I talked to you down there, you said you didn't have any fish, so what's the deal? No, I said we just got, I just got. Yeah, I asked you if you had any there. fish, and you said no, I just oh, got I here. Yeah, oh, I didn't So know it was a little confusing. That. Here's the deal. I asked you if you had fish down there, and you said no. Okay, you said you just got here and you didn't have any fish. What's the deal? Oh. 
Dan, like Dan, I'm gonna tell you something. Yeah. If you're lying to me, it's gonna be a problem. This well, is two fish. Well, we just got here and I caught the fish. I mean, that's Dan, I asked you down here if you had any fish, and you said no. I just got here. Oh. Okay, I'm a little confused, and now well, all I'm of a sudden I was confused too. Okay. Did you really catch these fish? Oh yeah, I sure. And you caught yes. them right here. Yes, I did. Yeah, you just found my hands. Right. Okay. I'm the warden's not getting a straight story, and now another angler is missing. And where's Randy at? I don't know. We'll have to find him. Yeah. Is he a fisherman too? Oh, well, I, he's a walker. He's just come along. Has he been fishing today? Uh, Randy? Yeah. I don't think he has. OK, he has he or has he not? How about yes or no? Has he been fishing or has well, he not? Well, I haven't been with him 100% of the time. Is this his car? Uh, no, this is Bill's car. OK, did you all come here in the same car? Yeah, we did. Why don't you just come stand over here and we'll just wait for Randy. The warden still wants to see this angler's license. Light. Here, I can hold it while you get that open. Yeah, if you hold it like, so I can see in that crack. You see up? Because the okay. handle's broke off. Yeah. Down low. There. Oh, I see what you're looking at. There you go. Do you remember where you bought your license? Yeah, I bought it at Walmart. No, I bought it at Sportsman's Warehouse, and I used a gift certificate. OK, uh, I'll have to go run you. I can't remember everything that was said, but there's something definitely wrong. No, true. All the things are wrong. I can't get on the computer right now, so I'm going to have to run you later on. Okay. okay. Well, all that information is current. As right. long as you have it, I'm good. I, I have no problem oh, with yeah. that. Yeah, okay. I do. All okay. right. Warden Goldie accounts for both men's license and fish. Still, something smells fishy, so the warden heads upstream to find their third fishing buddy. He's totally lying. Something's not right here. Phillipsburg, Montana. State Game Warden Terry Aldhouse checks anglers along Georgetown Lake. The season doesn't open till the third Saturday in May, and parts of the shoreline are closed till July 1st to protect spawning fish. A warm spring day tempts anglers, and Aldhouse stops several parties fishing the lake. How are we doing? <laughs> You can't have been here all that long today. No, just a few minutes. Wow, what do you got there? <laughs> you gonna keep you cool? <laughs> just what you needed. My license is in the bag there. All right, um, there is an oh, issue here we need to talk about. The uh, Do you have a set of fishing regulations? Uh, just got it, yeah. Do you have them with you? Yeah, I just got them right there. Okay, well, why don't we grab those? I wanna show you something there. Did you happen to look um, at the sign here as you came in? No. The one that says attention fishermen? No. Okay. Here's Georgetown. You see what uh, the first line is there? The first okay. sentence? Uh, third Sunday in May. Third Saturday. Third Saturday in May. Right, that's the issue. It's your fishing is it tomorrow? No. No, third Saturday would be the 19th this year, so it's about a week mm -hmm. out. Seems this angler missed the posted season signs, too. Here's where the dilemma I kind of find myself in. I, when we come up here and there's people fishing in the closed area for spawning, I'm pretty much expected to address that as a violation. But what I try to do is figure out whether it's deliberate or not. And that helps me decide what I'm going to do. And I, I guess I'm guessing that it's not. Yeah, I didn't um, deliberately do this. Here's what we're gonna do, probably issue a more minor violation for commission regulation violation and ask that you look at your regs more to avoid getting into a more serious situation. Can you do that? A citation is issued by Warden Aldhouse. Later that day, he spots another couple fishing. Yeah, he's got a pole propped up. I'm guessing it's out right now. He moves in to have a chat with this couple. Oh. Tony, how familiar are you with the regulations here? 
Um, a little bit. So are you aware, for example, of what limits are, season dates, that kind of thing? From my understanding, the dates change a little bit, but from my understanding, the fishing starts in February. Just basing that on when you've read the regulations in That's years correct. past? Okay. We do have a little bit of an issue here with the fishing season. Oh, really? Um, we're not to it yet which is probably why you're not seeing other anglers here. You do have your licenses, and we appreciate that. But what we have to do here is, when I come down to ask you these questions, it's because I'm trying to figure out whether you knew it was open or closed or whether you didn't. Obviously, it's more serious if you knew it was closed and you went anyway. And I guess my gut feeling is, is that you don't know. We wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's what I feel like. And uh, I will say, though, there is also, you know, some responsibility in your part to, to put a little effort into reading those. Aldhouse issues another commission rule and regulation ticket, which, you guessed it, carries a fine of 135 bucks. All right, you guys be safe for the rest of the day. In Region 4, Warden Brian Goley searches for a third angler in a fishing party. Earlier, he stopped these two men and their story just isn't adding up. The guy's lying. Something's not right here. The men track down their friend and Warden Goley questions him. What are you walking around with that backpack for? For the weight, for training. Uh-huh. Okay, so, hmm. All right, open, can you open this part of your, your pack? I was gonna go fishing, but I couldn't get a license. Okay. I went everywhere in town today to get a license, so I couldn't get one. Okay. Okay, what do you have in there? Fishing stuff, it's just all fishing stuff in the Mountain Dew. Okay. This is my uh, hooks and pumpkin. Okay, in the Mountain Dew, no problem. In, what's in here? Uh, hooks and pumpkin. Okay. You don't have any guns or anything in no, there? No, Okay. But you don't have any fish or anything in there? No, okay. So you went fishing today, right? Uh, earlier today, yeah, but it's like, uh, um... Okay, have you uh, handled any fish today? Uh, their fish. The more the warden questions the man, the more his story doesn't add up. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm a really fair guy. Okay. Until you start lying. Okay. Don't lie to me. Okay. Just don't do it. Here's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. How many fish did you catch today? No. You've never, you never caught any of these fish? No, I didn't catch any of the fish, no. When I'm driving down the road, are you sure you didn't grab your pack and run up on the hill? Grab my pack and run up on the hill? Yeah. When you repeat something, you know what that means to me? Right. It means you're lying. Okay? I asked you a question, and I'm getting tired of you lying. Okay. I asked you to be honest, and I told you, if you're honest, that I was going to be a gentleman with okay. you. When I'm driving down the road, did you take off up the hill? Uh, no, I was walking up and down the road because I couldn't really Okay, I know you I weren't doing walking. that because I've been up and down the road all afternoon and I have not seen you at all. Hmm. Okay, I must have been down on the bank or something. You, okay, we weren't with you. Okay. We would be guessing where you are. Mm -hmm. You should know where you are. Where were you? Okay, we weren't with you. Okay. We would be guessing where you are. Mm -hmm. You should know where you are. Where were you? I must have been down by the bank because there's the beaver slides right down in this area, and I mm -hmm. must have been down by the beaver slides. Okay. Is That's there any beaver. fishing equipment still down there? Um, no, I, I left my fishing pole somewhere up, up here somewhere. Okay, you don't have any guns or knives on no, you. No. Okay. I'll have a razor knife. That's yeah, we'll just leave it there. Knife. Okay, that's it. My is it? Should be above the cliff. That's right, right there. there. I see it. It's right there. There it is, right there. Okay. How many poles do you have? I have three. Okay. Why are they all laying right here? Because I was couldn't fish, and I just threw them up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Randy. I mean, okay, so you got a fresh worm on there, yep. okay, and you got a lure on there. So did you have one in the water and using the other one at the same time? No, never never more than one pole at one time. I no, I want to know where your slice. fish are too. Okay, there are no fish. 
When are you going to tell me that you got scared and threw these up here because you saw me and you didn't want to get in trouble? Because we're not done until you do that. Because I need to know, I need to know if you're an honorable individual that's going to tell me the truth. Okay, whatever, I, yeah, um, I threw it up there a while ago. I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was just recently a while ago. Okay, is it because you saw me, the game warden? Yeah, basically. Okay, so now, you... S I tried to get a license. Hey, listen, listen. The only reason you're being question right now you know why right. because you're lying not because you couldn't find a license or that you don't have a license and I didn't even okay push. I believe that part of your story you have to give me a chance to hear your story to make a decision on what's going to happen okay. but here's what here's the deal you couldn't find a license okay mm -hmm. you couldn't buy one because the system's down yeah. you came out here you saw me and you threw your stuff in the brush because you saw me then you stand here and you hide and you lie all right, guys, got it figured out. Okay. Did you, uh, did he stop at the store and try to buy licenses? Every store on the Every way store. out here. All right. Okay. And I'm sorry I misled you from the beginning. After questioning all three men, the warden finally gets to the bottom of their story. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this stuff down. I want to make sure that I do this consistently with all people that had a problem today with the license system sales. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know how easy this would be if you just came up and said that? You'd already be leaving. But the hiding and the, all that does is tell me that, you know, you don't respect the law, okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. Obviously he's scared and it's amazing what people will do when they're scared. But it's also amazing what they'll do, you know, to try to get away from getting caught. And why take a chance like that? And it's probably because his friends drove all the way up here. I wish he would have just told me the truth right off. Hey Randy. I'm gonna do a little research on the ALS system being down, and then I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna think about what to do here, you know. Um, you did finally tell me the truth, and I do appreciate that, and that does mean a lot. And I'm a little upset with you hiding like that, and I, I kinda wanna write you a ticket for it, but at the same time, I wanna think about it to me and take into account what you said. And if you ever get contacted by the game warden or any law enforcement, do not run and hide. And your friends were lying for you too, so they must be, you know, good friends, I guess. They were protecting you. Okay, you're free to leave. No citations were issued, and this group was sent on their way. In the great state of Montana, game wardens fight a daily battle. They fight to enforce state game laws and protect our natural resources. This could be a good one. Today on Wardens, we take a deeper look into the minds of Montana's game wardens. Join us as we sit down with Brian Goley. What are you doing out here knowing this is my turf? You know I'd catch you. Jeff Dara, Joe Kambik, and John Lasovsky. Potentially one illegal outfit in here. Well, we're sitting here with uh, John Lasowski, Jeff Dara, Brian Goley, and Joe Kambik. And Jeff, you know, it's been three years we've had this warden show, and, and it actually all started with you and I. Um, I called you about it. What was, your, what was your initial reaction when I came to you to ask you about doing this show? Well, I think, I think anybody in law enforcement is a little apprehensive when it comes to the press because uh, uh, sometimes things don't turn out the way they really happen, so you're nervous, and I didn't know if it would be a good thing or a bad thing, but at the time we were kind of looking for ways to explain to the public what we did and how we did it. Sure. So what we're doing here is these are antlers that we took away from people last year that uh, came in before the 15th and cheated, and we caught them, and I think we seized over 80 antlers. We've got uh, three other trucks today. We split the antlers up, and uh, Ben and I here today are going to be deposited in these uh, 
in strategic locations for uh, hopefully people to find tomorrow. Kind of an Easter egg hunt, I guess, Montana style. But I thought it was a great idea. I thought it was something the public would like to see. I thought it might even be a good thing for Montana. This, this truly is a reality show. We don't fake it. This is just what happens out there every day. Right. Since we've been doing it, Brian, what do you think it's done for the state of Montana and, and for game wardens? Well, particularly for game wardens, I think there's a lot more awareness about what we do for a living. Uh, individually, it's hard to tell your story. Uh, what is it that you do for a living and why? You tell that one person at a time. Talking about this show, people are able to get to know us in th three or four episodes would have taken me 10 years sure. to get people to understand what it is that we do. But in the communities that we live, um, you know, you get there in a district and you build this relationship and it takes about three or four years. And then, you know, after six, seven years or nine years or whatever it may be, pretty soon everybody does know you. and. You can't get away from everything that you do. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I, I've seen it. I've rode with you a lot, and we pull up on people, and they're like, "Hey, it's Brian Goley." <laughs> yes, it is. How's it going? How are you guys? Not too bad. Enjoying our weekend. Did you survive the night? We did. It's so bad. We got still it got two bad. more to go. The creek's really cold, though. I'll right. tell you that. And we lost TV. We guys, lost her. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, come have a beer. Take a shut the camera off. Don't, 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 don't right? say anything to me. Don't steal my gun. Hey! Yeah, was that a guy? That was yeah. awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to I'm really get our room and we're gonna let you go. Oh no, I'll fall asleep in the crib. You're gonna pick me out though. See? Are you married? He's looking for something. Hell yeah! Outdoor channel! Yes! We are actually on Warden! People do recognize me, and I know they recognize these guys too. And it's uh, um, it's not really that big of a deal. I, I it's kind of nice because they recognize you for the right reasons. Because you hope you're presenting game wardens well on TV, and you're given a fact-based show of what in a reality show of what it's like to be. And so being recognized for that is good. Um, and it's funny, people will take a little bit of time and they'll kind of stand around and they'll, and then pretty soon they'll ask, hey, are you that guy? And that's a great way because they may have never ever talked to you before and it's a great way to talk about the show and what game wardens do. And it's fun to actually talk because it's very seldom is it ever negative. And I gotta tell you, there's a lot of people that ask if I'm Ryan Coley. <laughs> <laughs> wardens is brought to you in part by Glock, confidence to live your life. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a game warden? Well, today, we're taking you behind the scenes. What does it take to be a game warden? Uh, you know, for me, um, starting out early on in my early years, game warden was somebody that would meet you in the field and, and uh, you know, he would check your deer, do whatever, and he was kind of the modern day mountain man back then. Uh, self-starter is kind of the cliche that uh, when they advertise for a position, they're looking for a self-starter. Well, what's a self-starter? <laughs> you know, uh, it's got it's got a it's got a really big meaning to it, and it's the passion that the people have that are in this profession, whether in Montana or Florida or wherever. That passion runs deep. It's 4:30 a.m. and Montana's game wardens are already up and working. This isn't really even that early. We're 4.30, we slept in this morning. Kyle's here. <laughs> Are you sleepy? You're waking up. You're doing good. <laughs> what made you want to become a game warden? Uh, you know, I think I've always uh, deep down wanted to be a game warden. Um, I, you know, love to be outside. Um, I love, you know, I have a passion for protecting the resource. It's important to me. It's important to all of us. I think that's why we do it. Where'd you get Christmas trees? Christmas trees clear up back that way. Okay. Uh, National Forest on the other side of Spotted yeah, Dog. Okay, so you got permits for them? You have to get a permit for a Christmas tree? Yeah. Absolutely you do. Nope. <laughs> Don't have okay. one of them. You just never know what's going to happen, and you have to be ready for anything at any time. And, you know, we drive around in these offices, and at any second you leave that office, you're, you could be rescuing somebody, 
You could be fighting some guy who's, you know, a domestic dispute in a fishing access site. You could be backing up the local fire department on a fire, a car wreck. You just really never know. And as game wardens, the bigger, the, the more opportunity that you have with people being out recreating, the more opportunity is going to be for tragedy or opportunity just to contact people or opportunity for, you know, a percentage of people to break the law, whatever it may be. Goalie responds to a medical call in his rural district. Do you think you need to go to the hospital? Oh, I know I do. Why'd you, why didn't you stay there when you were there? Because I'm going home first. I got an appointment Wednesday. Well, what are we going to do with you right now? I mean, we I'm can't let you go truck. alone. I'm going to get my truck and drive home. Oh. There's a story. Wow. Now Warden Goalie finds himself in a pickle. You have my full permission to search that vehicle for contraband or anything else. <laughs> okay. We're no, not worried about that. I'm not a drug runner, you know, I could be. <laughs> I guess I could we... be carrying all kinds of marijuana. Let's go find out what he... In uh, episode one this year, we come out pretty strong, and uh, I know all of you guys weren't involved in this, but we were in the wart training, and uh, Joe, you were basically the first character to come on TV of the season, and you're dealing with a frantic lady. She's, she's screaming. How did it feel to you, you know, being part of that? Well, that's a good actor there. Um, she really, that, the whole point of that training is to, to elevate everything, you know, get your heart rate up, get you be able to think while things are, are a little tough. And she did really good, um, you know, and of course, you, during that training, everybody, you know, everybody gets their, their spot. Well, who's going to be tracking the bear? Who's going to be doing this? Who's going to be doing that? Well, who's going to take the crazy lady? Well, <laughs> pick me, I guess. I, I, I'm the guy that gets to go deal with them. Bears are unwelcome visitors in town, and wardens have a report that a wandering bear might have dragged away this woman's young daughter. Wardens gear up to find the girl and the bear. I'm sorry? A six-year-old girl Lota! named Rhoda was wearing a dress. Okay. She doesn't remember what color. Okay. And then it ran right in through here somewhere according to what they said. Right away, officers find themselves in dangerous territory. Thick woods make spotting a potentially dangerous bear almost impossible. <laughs> We don't want any more people in there. We're going to go in there and find that bear, okay? We're going to go in there and find that bear. You, you talk to those folks that do that wart training, they, uh, they'll tell you that's, I mean, you're going to have to keep mom out of the scene, and that's probably the hardest thing to do in that whole situation. Almost looks like something might have been drug right up here. Fishing gate! Just after lunchtime, wardens discover evidence of a potential victim. I'd like to see if there's any blood on it. Possibly a drag trail up here where something might have been drugged. Got some blood on the grass. Well, it was a, a wildlife human uh, attack response team is what the WART acronym is for. And uh, this training was a, was a big training. There were probably, what, 100 plus people there from all over the United States, really. And, and while I was there, we just so happened to have a grizzly bear call uh, that day where an individual had shot a grizzly bear that was in his yard. And it, and it limped off wounded. If she's not hit, she'll come busting down that hill. Okay. And then once I get eyes on her, and then I can just hurt her like a cat down the hill. Oh, there she is. So I uh, got to miss a whole bunch of the training, I guess, so to speak, and went out and did the real field application of it with a few of the guys. Uh, trying to track down this wounded grizzly. So I didn't get to see all this training. So um, I go down to Steve's to review this show, and I'm sitting there all intent to watch it. And here's Joe doing a great job trying to calm down this with this woman, and, and I'm the captain thinking, oh, what did I miss? I'm going to go. And he had me hooked. I thought it was real. I mean, it was that good. You know, I, I thought, geez, what did I miss? I didn't hear about this, and it was the training. Yeah. <laughs> John, you know, how important is that training as a game warden? It's critical. I mean, whether it's search and seizure or domestic stuff or whatever it is, I mean, I think that, you know, we train for Sims, we train for our pistol qualifications, you name it. Um, we meet twice a year. 
and our folks that do the training are actually trying to keep it fresh, keep something new for the things that we might encounter out in the field. And It's really important. Um, we don't rely or can't rely on a radio call to call some specialist down the street to come help us. And you know, these bigger cities and bigger departments, they have people that specialize in different aspects of, of law enforcement. Game wardens don't have the luxury. We have to be specialized in all aspects of law enforcement because you're by yourself all the time. I mean, one day you're driving a jet boat, the next day you're on a quad runner, you may be on a motorcycle, you could be on a horse, or you're in your truck, um, or you're hiking. And you may have a shotgun at a bear incident or a dart gun uh, administering drugs at another incident. And, and we've done all that We've too. done it all, and all the game wardens have. And they, anybody that's listening to this, whether you're, doesn't matter what part of the country you're in, they, they understand what I'm talking about. You have to be good at all of it. I know none of you guys have been involved in this particular show, but we always do the boat float. And uh, this year it was just mass pandemonium. There was so much going on. And those boys in Region 5, I mean, they got their hands full there. Yep. You know, my hat's off to those guys too, because they got a, a tough job, you know, and there's a difference in a, in a, like a district, you know. They're running jet boats. I had no idea when I, I saw that episode and I just thought they were down checking fishermen, that type of deal. When that episode came on, I was standing in front of the TV going, holy crap, look what these guys are doing. And <laughs> they it was, were saving was, lives. They were saving lives, and I was, I was impressed. I yeah. mean, it was pretty amazing to watch. Region 5 wardens put their lives on the line at the 2012 Yellowstone boat float. It's going to be a good one. A whitewater section with Class 3 raft. Almost immediately, one boat goes over and wardens move in. Well, we'll have to let them run out a little bit. That's what we'll do. You guys got a jacket on? Let's go. Let's go if we're going. One, two, three. Let's go. This boat going sideways. This is a dangerous job. Officers must try and maneuver the rescue boat in fast water, and they have to get close enough to rescue stranded swimmers. Your hand. Thank you. One, two, three. Okay. There's a free raft right there. That's okay, we'll let it go, we'll let it go. Let it go, Get Randy. Up there. Oh. This is total mayhem, Randy. Are you okay? Are you okay? Suddenly, one man struggles to keep his head above water. Wardens need to get to him before he goes under. The subject's car has been spotted and officers spring into action. Deputies are going to make a traffic stop as wardens close in to make the arrest. So, John, what was probably the most dangerous thing that you've ever done as a game warden? Oh man, um, probably some of the takedowns that we've done. I mean, so and we've had, you know, maybe six in my career that have been fairly high profile. But that would be the biggest ones, you know, some out of Missoula in your area there. But when we get into the takedown situations where we're going in to actually do or, or you know, uh, put a search warrant through and you're on an entry team or something of that nature that, you know, you're going through a door. And, and you don't uh, know what you're going to run not into. Not knowing what's on the, on the other side. And yeah, it'll pull the hair up on your neck. Sure. So. Speaking of that, you know, we did a takedown show where you made an arrest on a, on a guy. It was started by you. Um, and it went into an undercover case that took several years right. and, and we made that into a show and just this year we finally got to go in the courts with them and actually see what happened from that case. Uh, these are the worst of the worst as far as wildlife crimes are concerned. Uh, they stole opportunities away from the public of Montana. Um, the number of deer they killed, the number of elk they killed, stole those opportunities away from some young kid or some family. What is your plea then to count one hunting with an artificial light? 
From your standpoint, how did that make you feel to actually sit in the courtroom and, and watch them getting sentenced? Well, that's that's a hard being a game warden. Actually, sometimes I think catching them is the easy part, and getting them all the way through the court system um, is the tough part. Um, and to, but to see that is really good because you 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 actually saw you started something and you finished it and the public gets to see that you finished it as well and that these people are going to be held accountable for the things that they've done and why is it so important is because you're the reason that they're held accountable and to see that all happen is really important so the total uh, restitution is eleven thousand one hundred and fifty seven dollars and sixty cents the fines are all suspended and um, uh, his driving or his driving his hunting and fishing and trapping privileges are forfeited for life. His firearms are forfeited. And uh, he has to remain law-abiding. And then there are other, all the other uh, conditions completely. Any questions? No. What was it like getting a call at 2 o'clock in the morning? You know, you're married. And all of a sudden, you got a two o'clock in the morning call. Right, right. Well, you know, as game wardens, we are, the warden's districts are very large in size. Our average district size is 2,000 square miles, and and uh, you're kind of, you're the guardian of the wildlife in that area. So you don't know what you're getting into. You just got big report that shots fired, spotlight being worked, and uh, there's a high chance that you're going to run into somebody that's been drinking alcohol and they're violating the law, and you're the only one going out there to see what's going on. Speaking of that, Joe, we, we did a, a, a patrol this year, kind of a late night patrol, and we brought in a bunch of wardens into your region. We did a saturation, we put up some decoys, and we saw what we felt could be somebody that might do just that. Well, you, as a game warden, you spend all that time outside, and you know, you're you're waiting for something to happen and sometimes it doesn't happen. When you see that car, you can look at it and you know that's the one. Yeah. That's the slow roll, that's the classic slow roll. They're just looking for something to kill. And uh, you know, it was a perfect night for it that night. No wind, it was clear, it wasn't too cold. Um, the, those folks out that we knew what they were up to. We knew we had to get something in front of them. And, I thought that they might have some, some real animals out in front of them when they went up. And luckily they didn't because we were still able to catch them and we didn't have to sacrifice a real animal. But um, we made a move and uh, it worked out for us. Hey, you know, let's just go take a look at it real quick. It was, it was kind of, a, I mean, a fast deal. I jumped in the ditch with a camera. You backed up in your truck and, and Dan Curtin was there. We had all kinds of guys there. It was, it was really neat. So let's go take a look at it real quick. The team sets up and wires their decoy in complete darkness. This is good. This is good stuff, Terry. They're on the road. We came up and there's no reason for them to go up this way. Yeah, they were just there for a little bit. It appears that they're probably up to no good. Seconds later, the team spots the truck. On foot, the wardens can't stop the driver. He races away, not knowing a second security team has him pegged. Let's see your hands. Get your hands up. Get them up. You're watching Wardens only on Outdoor Channel.
Welcome back to the Wardens Roundtable. We're talking with Montana Game Wardens, getting behind the scenes insight into their daily lives. John, we, we did something that we really never did before, and we, we actually went on a horse patrol. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a reason for that patrol, and because mm -hmm. there's been problems in that area. Right. And I noticed in the very beginning, you loaded up a shotgun. Yeah. This is for protection, actually. I've been up here before, and it just, uh, it's just nice to have a long gun. The wardens had received a tip that they could discover a few hunters who do not want to see the law. You know, the, the original reason that we went into that, um, into the crazies up there is last year um, we had a, Forest Service LEO that had actually an armed confrontation with a gentleman. And it was somebody that I dealt with a couple years before that, in fact, had a, a you know, a case with them. And, and um, I got word that he was back. You know, so when we started into that deal, um, we kind of knew that there was a potential when we were riding in there, we were gonna come head on with this guy. And, and we did, he was actually the first person we came in contact with that day. You know, that's gotta be an elevated feeling you know, we rode away from that guy. Kind of what was going on in your mind? Um, <laughs> truthfully, um, you know, when we rode away and, and the contact was good. He had a guy with him, of course, that uh, had a bird license at 8,000 feet, you know, wasn't elk hunting. And, and uh, he had the right to be there, so we treated him as a regular contact. But is when, when I crawled back on that horse, we had about 400 yards of open country to go by, and I had my back to him the whole time riding out of there, and I thought, if he wants me, I'm right here. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be nothing. I kept looking over my shoulder, but um, it was uncomfortable. Let's just put it that way. As a game warden, you guys gotta really pay attention and be on your game. We ran into a guy on the trail. He told us one story. We run into a guy with another out down. We get to the camp. We don't know they're all associated at that point. Right. But we heard the same stories. We went and had lunch, we come back, and, and now all of a sudden, what happens? We Yeah, we, we bail into it. In fact, you know, we went and had lunch, and I think everybody that left when we made the first contact into that camp, everybody knew something was wrong. I mean, it was, we left there going, what did we miss? So we built the fire, had a sandwich, and talked about it, and decided to go have another talk. And by the time we got back down the second go around, um, they knew we were coming back and things started coming apart for them. It's not like it's a, a guy that does it for a living. No, it's no, not an outfitter. No, it's not like an outfitter or nothing like that. So does yeah. he have to be permitted then? Is he doing, are we doing something illegal there? He would have to be permitted. He would have to be permitted. Yeah, I mean, because honestly, I have, I have legitimate outfitters up here. Okay. Warden Lasomsky discovers the man who hauled in these hunters is operating illegally without an outfitter license. That's the first problem solved. This is how I kind of come back and ask a couple questions about it. Well, I just, after we got done chatting, I thought I'd talk to you down below. And first I thought we talked about two elk and then possibly a third. Oh. When I chatted with you down Lodgepole. The hunters appear a bit nervous as the wardens question them about the number of elk they've harvested. Their story just doesn't add up. So do you have your license on you? Yeah, That's one yeah. thing I didn't do was check yeah. you. He, he said the same thing. He said uh, yeah. something about... Uh, Did I check person? you? No. Can I check you? <laughs> check license. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. This hunter hands the warden a validated elk tag. It should be attached to the harvested animal. And what did you, is the this just, this just your conservation? Do you have, did you get an elk or yeah. where's the rest of it? And then where's your elk? A little bit of snow. In the corner here. Around the corner? Why don't you show me your elk? It appears these hunters aren't telling the wardens the truth. Now they have a problem. Wardens is brought to you in part by Glock, confidence to live your life. Up on Montana's crazy mountain range, state game wardens try and get the truth out of a group of suspicious elk hunters. And then where's your elk? A little bit of snow. In the corner. Around the corner? Mm -hmm. Why don't you show me your elk? Warden John Lasovsky suspects these men lied about how many animals they'd harvested. A hunter finally admits to a third kill out behind camp. Is that why you've got the horns hid? Because he wasn't. Well, that was not here yet. Yeah, he wasn't up here or whatever, you know, this type thing. 
Okay. Is that why you're awful quiet? There's sometimes there's telltale signs when you see these things, and every one of us, we've seen them. And, and it's, it's not rocket scientists sometimes to figure these things out. And that particular case, one guy, John sat down and this guy's back just whoop, he turned around and he was away from him. You know, and I know you, there's things you've told me that how you pick up on these things, you know? Yeah, you bet. It, it's, 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 you know, there's some training that you can take for that, but a lot of it is just from experience, you know? And that, that show with John was really good because uh, I haven't had the privilege to work with John a lot, and, and I'm watching him and I'm, I'm kind of going, John, John, check over there, <laughs> you know, look behind the tent, you know? But he had it, you know, he, he was, he was uh, his wheels were spinning and he had it, so. Um, it is, you know, whether you just watch a guy's body language or how he says things, you, you watch all that. And Sometimes you can tell just by the tone of their voice. Absolutely. Or they won't look at you. Yeah. They'll look down or they'll look That's away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Speaking of that, yeah. Brian, we had, a, we had a really fun one too this summer. We were checking some fishermen late in the evening. Instantly you knew he was lying. And Sometimes if they just tell you the truth, it's not that big a deal. And that particular day, the, um, the license system was down. That's correct. And this guy was just going on and on and on. In, what's in here? Uh, oh, please, please, please. Okay. You don't have any guns or anything in there? No, no. Okay. But you don't have any fish or anything in there? Okay. So you went fishing today, right? Uh, earlier today, yeah, but it was like, uh, um, Okay, have you uh, handled any fish today? Uh, there are fish. The more the warden questions the man, the more his story doesn't add up. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm a really fair guy okay. until you start lying. Okay. Don't lie to me. Okay. Just don't do it. Here's what I want to know. When I'm driving down the road, are you sure you didn't grab your pack and run up on the hill? Grab my pack and run up on the hill? Yeah. When you repeat something, you know what that means to me? Yeah. It means you're lying. Okay, I asked you a question, and I'm getting tired of you lying. Okay. I asked you to be honest, and I told you if you're honest that I was going to be a gentleman with okay. you. When I'm driving down the road, did you take off up the hill? Uh, no, I was walking up and down the road because I couldn't really fish. Okay, I know you I weren't doing walking. that because I've been up and down the road all afternoon, and I have not seen you at all. Hmm. Okay, I must have been down on the bank or something. You, okay, we weren't with you. Okay. We would be guessing where you are. Mm -hmm. You should know where you are. Where were you? When you run into that, what goes on in your mind? You know, you're, you're thinking to yourself, why won't this guy give it up? Well, that's really important. It's why would an average member of the public lie to a law enforcement officer? And there is a percentage of people that will do that, and those are the percentage of people that we pay attention to. And there's no reason for him to lie. And if he's lying, he's hiding something. And in this case, um, his friends, you know, not only pressured him into going fishing, but they also lied for him, which made it even, you know, harder to figure out. Um, the guy was just embarrassed. He'd had a tough week. He did everything in his power to get a license, and I believe him. And that's why, you know, we gave him a break in the end. But um, I went through that process to, to make sure that he would know that the next time he tried that, he would get taken all the way to the carpet on it. Yep. And you know, people say, well, you might be, you were a little harsh. Well, trying to break a person out of a lying or you know, trying to get them to come back to reality, sometimes you have to be a little bit blunt. And you know, I don't get paid to be his friend. I get paid to protect the resource and I hope exactly. I make friends along the way. But to break him out of his uh, lie and, and to make sure that he knew absolutely that I didn't believe him. In order to move on from that contact, that's something that had to be done. How many poles do you have? I have three. Okay, why are they all laying right here? Because I was, couldn't fish and I just threw them up here. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, Randy. I mean, okay, so you got a fresh worm on there. Okay, and you got a lure on there. So did you have one in the water and using the other one at the same time? No, never never more than one pole at one time. I no, I want to know where your like. fish are too. Okay, there are no fish. When are you going to tell me that you got scared and threw these up here because you saw me and you didn't want to get in trouble? Because we're not done until you do that. Because I need to know, I need to know if you're an honorable individual that's going to tell me the truth. 
Okay, whatever. I, yeah, um, I threw them up there a while ago. I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was just recently a while ago. Okay, is it because you saw me, the game warden? Yeah, basically. Okay. When you have to ask somebody every particular question to get them to answer, um, you know something's wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, as game wardens, don't write a guy a ticket for blowing a stop sign or catch him speeding. We at least, when the crime is over, we have to work backwards from that crime. Sure. And that's where I think you'll, if somebody said, well, what's the difference between a game warden and a police officer? Well, we really start at a crime and work back to a suspect. Right, if you're not there and you're trying to piece everything together, um, that's how you have to do it. And like Brian said, you know, if they lie to you, you got to go through the process, you know, the whole thing. You got to know the questions to ask, when to ask them. Uh, just, just keep going. You got to put it all together. It's a puzzle. You got to ask those questions. And that's why he, he did it. I mean, did you really find it odd that his fishing rods were on the other side of the road up halfway up the mountain? I mean, definitely not normal behavior. Fish, fish don't live up there. So, I mean, yeah. and he never I'm not even a biologist. I can tell you that fish are not going to be on that side of the road. We're going to check the fishermen. You guys catching any? Right away, Warden Bill Copen spots a boat and instantly finds a problem. I'll just come around if you can get your licenses out. I got mine as well. That's not a good spot for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you? You're looking kind of paralyzed. Do you have yours? Of course I do. You don't, do you? Yeah. Bill is, he's a, he's a crazy one. He's fun. <laughs> He's very good at his job. We all have nicknames. <laughs> but poor Bill, he pulls up on his boat and he says, ask him about fishing licenses. Right. I saw and, that. Uh, Three out of four people don't have a license. You guys need to figure this out. You know, but, you know, Bill. He could read that instantly. Oh, yeah. Didn't he say, you look a little paralyzed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what he meant by that was, you don't have a license. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you watch that episode, which I'm sure you have it, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he just called it out. He says, right. you don't have a license, do you? And, you know, they had that deer in the headlight look like, what do I say? <laughs> uh, I don't want to give up the, the ghost that easy or that quick. But Bill is a, is a veteran warden, and, and uh, I've been his captain for, for several years. And, and uh, that, was, that was cool to watch because he was polite. He was jovial. And uh, when I think when he left, I think they were going to buy him a chicken dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> It's a hundred and thirty-five dollar bond. Oh, there's no way I'm gonna pay You that. don't have to. You're going to court, you said. Oh yeah. I oh, put yeah, down I did he's not a, receive he's a it. Residence. Now oh, if you yeah. guys Oh man, now see what you made me do? I didn't even put my hardcover under that and now that one's gonna have your name on it. You gotta have two now. Oh. I have to give you two. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I think I seen this guy when we ate at that place in Steve, remember? Oh, I, I, oh no, I, at the, the coop, chicken place? the chicken yeah, coop. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what I'm wondering. Oh, what did yeah. I see? Yeah, How come I you guys people. didn't offer to buy my chicken? <laughs> I know people. Okay, another question for you, sir. Where is the fish at? Where are they biting? Oh, well, you got to go get a license well, before you well. check that out, buddy. Uh, up there by the weeds. If you hit those weeds with those bait, crank baits you had, be in the deep water. Hit right at the edge and reel out. They'll what come out. You're from Minnesota, man. I shouldn't yeah. have to tell you that. I mean, I just, I just don't know this pond. You know, it's kind of this pond? Now, come on. You're offending me That's calling a this a pond. That's a lake. It's a lake. Yeah. You're in Montana yeah. now, buddy. All right, you guys. Uh, thank you. Oh, no, have thank you. No, thank you for what? Are you kidding me? Don't thank me. He's doing his job. Yeah, that's what I like. For half yeah, an hour. Nikolai, you gotta listen to them a little. That's what you need. Just doing my I'm job. Gonna, if I see drop, I ain't even gonna wait. You're not gonna buy my chicken at the coop? I might. You All right. Buy. Have Bill, who's gonna buy you? No, I said Nikolai is. Oh, I might, me. <laughs> that's. That's uh, too much fun. You know you have it figured out in your district when you got people buying your dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's important you bring that up. If you get the bad guys and you treat them right, down the road, that's going to come back to that's help right. you out. Yeah. And, 
I mean, they'll, you might walk into a restaurant and sit down with your wife and get in the Donnybrook and then have a guy come in and save your butt that you had written a ticket to, but you treat him like a gentleman and you treat him professional. And unfortunately in this job at times, you guys brought it up, is that you actually have to tell people they're lying. And that's not the society way of doing things. You're stepping outside of that. And you have to be careful because you can make people really upset. But at the same time, it's really the only way to get to the bottom of what's going on. And you try to do it professionally and uh, hope that you can leave with a handshake. Sure. And, and that's one thing that almost every time you guys write a ticket, there's always a thank you from them. They're thanking you for giving them a ticket, and there's a handshake. Easy now. Okay, so you're gonna take care of that, and it wasn't too bad. We worked that out. Yeah, yeah, thanks for taking, you betcha. taking it easy on me. Not a problem. My favorite part of the day was probably when I uh, actually, I think probably the third shot. <laughs> <laughs> when she was dead? When she yep. dropped and hit the dirt, that's the best part of the day. Yep. John, what do you think is the most rewarding part of being a game warden? I think it's when you, you know, when you're out in the field and you finally meet that hunting camp, it's got a couple of kids in it, the 12 year old, the 14 year old. And you reflect back a little bit and think, geez, I was there not too many years ago. And you actually have the ability to have a positive influence on you know, that particular situation and maybe pick them out of the crowd versus checking a license. You pick them out and have a conversation and um, maybe try to leave an impression. You know, you know, when, they, when they're all done, they felt like they got to you know, be part of the bigger deal. Yeah. Well, the morning started off pretty slow, but uh, things picked up. We drove by here and saw a lot of action, and uh, we ended up getting this one. Yeah, pretty exciting, real exciting. To see these kids or to see some 80-year-old guy on his last elk hunt or whatever it may be to be successful, that's more important than catching a bad guy. I mean, for us, we get a lot more out of that. Sure. But we'll catch the bad guy to make sure that that will continue down the road. That was the last Well, I hit her here killed. and then I went right through there. And the second shot, we had like come down to get away so she wouldn't see us. And then she kind of got up. Of course, all the guts were hanging out the bottom of her, but she got up and started moving. I just shot, I missed. But yeah, it's not a miss, it's a warning shot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a warning shot? Yeah, something's happening. What We're is that? Lead. Uh, me and my dad sighted this gun in. Uh, we do all our own hand loading for it. This is a Savage Model 11 and 308 Winchester. Uh, it was used to kill my antelope. It's, it's been a good gun. Well, I would say, you know, if you decide not to shoot, you know, it's always a fun hike and it's always beautiful and it's always nice out here in Montana. We get to see how things, when things happen, how bad it can be and how good it can be. But if this job wasn't personal in some respect, we probably wouldn't be that good at it. And how important is a landowner relationship? Critical. And it, you know, it, and you talk about a district that's a standalone district and you're, you know, the only guy that is kind of the face of the department when you're out here and how you treat your landowners is, is absolutely critical. Um, there wasn't anything that you can get done enforcement-wise without their help. I mean, if you come into a, a district and and you don't take that into consideration, you're not going to go very far. Um, you know, it's it's 70 percent of Montana is, is is you know privately owned, and you better figure that out in a big hurry. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's key. I mean, being a game warden, you need to have those relationships, um, whether it be for, you know, they're telling you, you know, who the bad guys are, who, who you know, what they're doing, or whether, you, you know, let's face it, they, you know, a lot of them, they raise a lot of the wildlife, and we're that conduit between the sportsman and the landowner. And sometimes those two groups butt heads, and you got to make sure that you're, you're doing your best as, as the game warden in your district to try to bridge that gap. So we got some hunters that shot a deer where they had permission. That deer eventually got over onto you, and they actually drug it out across part of your, your property. They hadn't contacted you. Something like this, the law says you have to have permission to, to hunt. That includes retrieval or crossing private land to hunt. Um, but it's kind of it's up to you. You know, whether you want a, a ticket wrote or, or what you want me to do with this. I wish they would have contacted me and asked me about four wheelers and stuff like that. Sure. More than likely, it's probably just an honest mistake on their part. 
but I wouldn't mind shaking the tree pretty hard with those guys so okay. they don't cross over or tell their buddies to come in here and push the boundaries. Well, I'll go back. There's one guy in the group I haven't checked yet. Look at his license and, and we'll visit about the kill site and stuff, verify that this is their kill site, which I think it is. All right, Rick, I'll, I'll talk to these guys. You didn't want me to cite them is what I gathered, so take care. People probably think it's tax dollars that fund yeah. fund a game warden, and it really isn't that. What what funds FWP? I think that's a you know a, a great American story in the fact that you know there are a lot of people out there that uh, want to preserve or protect nature, and, and and the real story is sportsmen of the United States of America have saved wildlife yeah. because it's their purchasing of license dollars, whether it's the hunt or fish. And for game wardens, uh, in most states, it's not that you know we, we're, we're government employees and their tax dollars pay for us to go out and, and do all these things. It's the hunting and fishing public that pays for us to be out there. Sure. They're paying for us to be out there to monitor them and to protect their wildlife. Exactly. So every time somebody buys a license, it helps pay for us. Just because we got that patch on the arm and that star on our chest doesn't mean we don't pull our pants up the same way as they do every day. And, That's right. You know, the big thing for me is, is you know, when I focus when I get done with uh, work is my wife and my kids and my, my grandkids. I mean, that's my focus. And, um, you know, without them, you, you, uh, you don't have anything. And they do, they do put up with an awful, awful lot. That's they, the big thing. Um, we're very specialized in, in what we do. Uh, people don't understand it. And there's kind of this, there's a fence between us. Until people climb over that fence or we jump over and grab them and talk to them, there's always going to be that. But this show has broke down that barrier and helped out a lot. And it, people will come up to us and I think that they need to keep doing that. They keep Come up to us, talk to us, work things out, talk to us about anything that you want because we get paid for it and we enjoy that part of it. It's been a, a really fun deal working with all these game wardens. We want to thank every one of you again and uh, especially our viewers because without the viewers we wouldn't have the show. So we want to thank you as a viewer and we'll see you all next year.